Unit 1. What makes us human? Tape script 1.1. The reunion. Hey, Bridget. <laughs> hey, how was your school reunion? Wasn't that last weekend? Yeah, yeah, it was good. Hmm? Well, it was okay. Only that I didn't recognise quite a lot of the people and... Oh, well, has been nearly 15 years. Yeah, I know. And boy, do some people change. <laughs> You know, I'd find myself talking to someone who obviously knew who I was, and I hadn't a clue who they were. And I don't suppose you could have asked. Well, no, how rude would that have been? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I did recognise Judith, oh. you know, the dreaded jolly Judith. Oh. She hasn't changed at all, unfortunately. I tried to avoid her, but she sought me out. And so? So I'm like, hello, Judith, how are you? <laughs> Oh, big mistake, because mm -hmm. then, of course, I get it from her. Every detail of the last 15 years. Oh. You know, her ups and downs, her two failed marriages. Uh. Oh, no surprise there. <laughs> her fabulous third husband, the operation on her sinuses, the time she was made redundant, etc., etc. Oh. You know, go on, quiz me about Judith. I could write her biography. <laughs> I bet you promised to keep in touch, though. Well, you have to, don't you? <laughs> you hypocrite. Oh, but I managed to get away before giving my email address or mobile number. Oh, well done. Yeah. <laughs> hey, did you get the group photo I texted? Yeah, yeah, I did, but I could only identify you. Oh, and Brendan. Mm. He looked good. Tall, handsome as ever, but a um, bit weary. <laughs> you all look pretty fed up, to be honest. Uh, well, that's because we got the poor waiter to take our picture, oh. and everyone kept giving him their phone or camera. Oh. And by the time it got to mine, well, we were all looking a bit glum. Doesn't sound like a great success, this reunion. <laughs> oh, it was fine, really. I mean, most people were lovely, but... <sighs> Do you know the worst thing? No, what? Well, when I got to the station to catch the train home, who came gushing up to me on the platform? Oh! <sighs> Oh, how lovely! We can travel back together! Oh, no, not Judith! Yeah, you oh. got it in one. And after I'd spent an age saying a polite goodbye to her. <laughs> <laughs> I not believe it. Tape script 1.2 1. He really fancies himself. He thinks all women fall for his charm. 2. Honestly, just listen to yourself. You never stop moaning. 3. Don't put yourself down. Believe in yourself. 4. Look after yourself. You've been looking a bit peaky recently. 5. I could kick myself. I didn't get a phone number. 6. Think for yourself. You don't have to agree with everything he says. 7. Please yourself. You never listen to my advice anyway. 8. Just be yourself. Don't try to appear to be something that you're not. 9. Think of yourself sometimes. You're always putting others first. 10. Don't flatter yourself. You didn't win because you're the best. Your opponent was rubbish. Tape script 1.3 1. You look fabulous in it. It's perfect for you. I know, but look at the price. Go on, treat yourself. Oh, but... Don't but me. Tell yourself that you deserve it. OK, then. I'll get it. <laughs> Two. You've got to get over it. Move on in your life. I can't. I think she's starting to realise she's made a big mistake. Stop deluding yourself. It's over. I don't know. Maybe I'll just give her a call. Oh, believe me. You're only making a fool of yourself. Three. How's it going? It's a challenge. A real challenge. I'm up planning lessons until midnight most nights. You must be exhausted. You're going to have to learn to pace yourself or you'll be ill. I can't. 
I gave up the prospect of a good job in banking to do this, and I don't want to let myself or the kids down. Yes, but it's not worth killing yourself. You won't be any use to anyone. Four. Why did you do it? Oh, believe me, I keep asking myself the same question. You knew you'd never be able to pay it back. Now you've got yourself into a right mess. I know, I know, and I've only got myself to blame. What now? Uh, I suppose it'll have to be the bank of Mum and Dad. Tape script one point four. The Seven Ages of Man. By William Shakespeare. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. His acts, being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then, the whining schoolboy. With his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school, and then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honour. Sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth, and then the justice, in fair round belly with good capon lined, with eye severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts. Into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all, that ends this strange eventful history. Is second childishness and mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Tape script one point five. One. When I'm asked what I do for a living, I often hesitate a moment before answering because I'm never sure how people will react these days. Some just think we're fat cats who make fast, easy money like gamblers, but it's not like that. I work really hard, and there's a lot of risk involved, so it's really stressful. I get the seven o five every morning, and I often get back till after ten at night. And that's not because I'm hanging out with the guys in a bar somewhere. Oh no, I never get to put the kids to bed. I faced redundancy loads of times, but I've been lucky so far. We have a huge mortgage. So we both have to work, but at least my wife has a job share. She's a lawyer. Two. I don't like sleepovers. Everyone else does, but I just start to feel really sad at bedtime without my mum and dad there, and all my friends make fun of me. I don't mind playdates after school or something. Freddy was at mine today, and we played Wii Sports until Mum threw us outside into the garden. Stop squabbling, she said. Go get some fresh air and play football for real. But I did beat Freddy at the Wii, whatever he said. He's just a bad loser. Oh, it was freezing outside. Three. The one I was in closed down. They were lovely there. And I had a door in my room that opened onto the garden. I'd go out on a nice day and walk, with my frame, of course, to a bench under a laburnum tree. I don't even have a nice view from my room here, and and the door's so narrow I can't get my frame through it easily. 
I asked for new batteries for my hearing aid, and I'm still waiting. They don't have the staff, you see. I stay in my room a lot. I don't like sitting in the lounge with the telly on all the time and people sitting around falling asleep and snoring. I still have a good brain, you see. Some of them out there are away with the fairies. Four. I get called a nerd. If I'm honest, I do mind a bit, but not too much. Most of my classmates seem to take pride in being underachievers. Um, the thing is, I, I like good times too, you know, clubbing and stuff, um, parties when I'm invited. But there's something I really want to aim for. You see, I've had a weekend job for the last couple of years. I've been working at Specsavers, just helping out and stuff, but it's fascinating. It's really the highlight of my week. And so now I've decided I'd like to be an optometrist. Does that sound dull? My friends think so, but I'm dead keen. And I've got a place at Manchester University to study optometry if I get three A's. I'm determined to do it. Everyone else hasn't a clue what they want to do, so maybe I'm the lucky one. Script 1.6 1. I'm absolutely gutted. They were winning 2-0 at half-time, and then they went on to lose 3-2. 2. Two. You mean the world to me. More than words could ever say. 3. Wow, I'm completely blown away. I've never had such an expensive present. 4. I'll have to consult my diary. Life's just so hectic at the moment. I'm always so much in demand. 5. Come on, you can tell me. I'm dying to know. I won't breathe a word to anyone. 6. Could you not keep getting at me in front of our friends? It looks so awful. 7. Oh, yeah, so you run the company now after just a week in the job. Pull the other one. Eight. Thank God you're here. When we couldn't get through to you, we thought you'd had an accident. Nine. He came in the top two percent in the country, so his father and I are thrilled to bits. Ten. It was nothing. Really, nothing. Anybody would have done the same. Eleven. Well, I think you did very well to come third. Keep up the good work and you'll win next time. Twelve. Oh, come on now. Don't make such a fuss. You'll be fine. It's only a graze. Hardly bleeding at all. Thirteen. I'm out of here right now. I don't like the look of that lot on the corner. Fourteen. What do you mean I'm a couch potato? I go to the gym twice a week. Fifteen. I totally lost it with that poor guy, but it was the sixth call today. How do they get our numbers? Tape script 1.7. One. Oh, look at that! Two. Oh, look at that! Three. Oh, look at that! Four. <gasps> look at that! Five. Oh, look at that! Six. Oh, look at that. Seven. Oh, look at that. Eight. Oh, look at that. Nine. Oh, look at that. Ten.
<laughs> Look at that. Tape script 1.8. Personal profile. Jack Devoy, aged 18. I am currently a student at Hamsworth School, Birmingham, studying English literature, economics and history. I am a diligent and conscientious student and have attained grade A's in all my subjects in recent exams. I also try to give my utmost to other aspects of school life. I am a school prefect and have acted as a guide at numerous school open evenings. Literature has always played an important role in my life. I feel lucky to have been brought up in a family with a passion for books. I enjoy reading books from a wide range of genres, from Shakespearean comedies such as The Taming of the Shrew, to historical investigations such as Douglas A. Blackman's Slavery by Another Name. I particularly enjoy combining my interest in history with my love of literature, and so have read many historical books, a particular favourite being E. H. Gombrich's A Little History of the World. I often have strong views on any text I read, and this helps me when I come to analyse them for my studies. In addition to my love of reading, I really enjoy drama and acting. This year, in my role as prefect, I ran the Interhouse Drama Competition, where I directed younger students in a short comedy play, Melons at the Parsonage. I look forward to getting involved in any drama groups at university. Outside of school, I have a strong interest in film and theatre. I have seen numerous interesting plays, including The 39 Steps and War Horse, and I follow the blog of respected film critic Mark Commode, which has given me an insight into the film industry. I would really like to combine my interest in film and theatre with my study of English. Alongside my studies, I feel I could contribute a great deal to university life generally. I am a keen sportsman, and I have represented my school in football, cricket, basketball and athletics. Playing in numerous sports teams has taught me the importance of good teamwork and strong leadership. I would love to continue playing a variety of sports at university. Looking ahead, I would really like to go into a career in the media, either in television and film, or journalism. As I have mentioned, I tend to have a strong view on most texts I read, so could envisage myself becoming a literary or film critic. I know that a degree in English literature would be the springboard to success in these fields. Unit 2 in so many words. Tape script 2.1. George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw, 1856 to 1950, was an Anglo-Irish playwright. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1925. Shaw's instincts were to refuse this honour, but his wife persuaded him to accept it as a tribute to Ireland. He also won a Hollywood Oscar in 1939 for the film version of his play Pygmalion. He is the only writer to win both awards. He wrote over 60 plays, but Pygmalion is probably his most famous work because in 1956, after his death, it was adapted into the highly successful musical for stage and screen My Fair Lady. He died, aged 94, after falling off a ladder. Tape script 2.2 Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw Act 2, Scene 1 Professor Higgins' Laboratory Well, I think that's the whole show. It's really amazing. I haven't taken half of it in, you know. Oh, would you like to go over any of it again? Uh, uh, no, thank you. Not now. Tired of listening to sounds? Yes, it's a fearful strain. I rather fancy it myself because I can pronounce 24 distinct vowel sounds, but your 130 beat me. I can't hear a bit of difference between most of them. <laughs> oh, that comes with practice. 
What's the matter? A young woman wants to see you, sir. A young woman? What does she want? Well, sir, she says you'll be glad to see her when you know what she's come about. She's quite a common girl, sir. Very common indeed. I should have sent her away. Only I thought perhaps you wanted her to talk into your machines. Oh, that's all right, Mrs. Pierce. Has she an interesting accent? Oh, something dreadful, sir, really. I don't know how you can take an interest in it. Let's have her up. Show her up, Mrs. Pierce. Very well, sir. It's not for me to say. This is rather a bit of luck. I'll show you how I make records. We'll set her talking, and then we'll get her onto the phonograph so that you can turn her on as often as you like with a written transcript before you. This is the young woman, sir. <sighs> Why? This is the girl I jotted down last night. She's no use. Uh, be off with you. I don't want you. Oh, don't you be so saucy. You ain't heard what I come for yet. Oh, we are proud. He ain't above giving lessons. Not him. I heard him say so. Well, I ain't come here to ask for any compliment. And if my money's not good enough, I can go elsewhere. I'm come to have lessons, I am. And to pay for him too, make no mistake. Well, what is it you want, my girl? I want to be a lady in a flower shop. But they won't take me unless I can talk more genteel. He said he could teach me. Well, here I am, ready to pay him, not asking any favour, and he treats me as if I was dirt. What's your name? Eliza Doolittle. How much do you propose to pay me for the lessons? Oh, I know what's right. A lady friend of mine gets French lessons for 18 pence an hour from a real French gentleman. Well, you wouldn't have the face to ask me the same for teaching me my own language as you would for French. So I won't give more than a shilling. Take it or leave it. It's almost irresistible. She's so deliciously low, <sighs> so horribly dirty. I ain't dirty. I washed my face and hands before I come, I did. You're certainly not going to turn her head with flattery, Higgins. I shall make a duchess of this draggle-tailed gutter snipe. Oh, wow! Yes, in six months, in three if she has a good ear and a quick tongue, I'll take her anywhere and pass her off as anything. We'll start today, now, this moment. Take her away and clean her, Mrs. Pierce. Oh, ah, oh. Tape script 2.3 Pygmalion Act 2, Scene 2 Professor Higgins' Laboratory Say your alphabet. Oh, I know my alphabet. Do you think I know nothing? I don't need to be taught like a child. Say your alphabet. Say oh. it, Miss Doolittle. <sighs> you will understand presently. Do what he tells you and let him teach you in his own way. Oh, well, if you put it like that. A. B. Say. D. Stop! <sighs> Listen to this, Pickering. <laughs> This is what we pay for as elementary education. This unfortunate animal has oh. been locked up for nine years in school at our expense to teach her to speak and read the language of Shakespeare and Milton. And the result is A, oh. B, C, D, C, A, B, C, D. Oh, 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 but, but, but I'm saying it. A, B, C. Stop. Oh. Say a cup of tea. A uh, uh, cup of tea. Put your tongue forward until it squeezes against the top of your lower teeth. Now say cup. Uh, 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 I can't. Cup. Good. Splendid, Miss Doolittle. By Jupiter. She's done it at the first shot. Pickering, we shall make a duchess of her. Now, do you think you could possibly say tea? Not tea, mind.
Mind, if you ever say B, C, D again, you shall be dragged around the room three times by the hair of your head. T, 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 T. I can't hear no difference, except that it sounds more genteel like when when you say it. Well, if you can hear that difference, what the devil are you crying for? Pickering, give her a chocolate. No, no, never mind crying a little, Miss Doolittle. You are doing very well, and the lessons won't hurt. I promise you, I won't let him drag you round the room by your hair. Be off with you to Mrs. Pierce and tell her about it. Think about it. Try to do it by yourself, and keep your tongue well forward in your mouth instead of trying to roll it up and swallow it. Another lesson at half past four this afternoon. Away with you. Tape script two point four, Act Three, Scene One, Mrs. Higgins' drawing room. How do you do, Mrs. Higgins? Mr. Higgins told me I might come. <laughs> Quite right. I'm very glad indeed to see you. How do you do, Miss Doolittle? Colonel Pickering, is it not? <laughs> I feel sure we have met before, Miss Doolittle. I remember your eyes. How do you do, my daughter Clara? How do you do? How do you do? I've certainly had the pleasure.、Uh, my son Freddy. How do you do?、Uh, will it rain? Do you think? The shallow depression in the west of these islands. Is likely to move slowly in an easterly direction. There are no indications of any great change in the barometrical situation. <laughs> How awfully funny! What is wrong with that, young man? I bet I got it right. Killing. I'm sure. I hope it won't turn cold. There's so much influenza about. It runs right through our whole family regularly every spring. <gasps> My aunt died of influenza, so they said. But it's my belief they done the old woman in.、Uh, done her in? Yes. Lord love you. Why should she die of influenza? She come through diphtheria right enough the year before. <laughs> I saw her with my own eyes. Fairly blue with it she was. They all thought she was dead, but my father he kept ladling gin down her throat till she came to so sudden that she bit the bowl off the spoon. <coughs> Dear me, what call would a woman with that strength in her have to die of influenza? What become of her new straw hat that should have come to me? Somebody pinched it, and what I say is, them as pinched it done her in. What does doing her in mean? Oh, that's the new small talk.、Uh, to do a person in means to kill them. You surely don't believe that your aunt was killed? Do I not? Them she lived with would have killed her for a hat. Pin, let alone a hat. But it can't have been right for your father to pour spirits down her throat like that. It might have killed her. Not her. Gin was mother's milk to her.、Oh. Besides, he'd poured so much down his own throat that he knew the good of it. <laughs> Do you mean that he drank? Drank?、Uh, my word! Something chronic. How dreadful for you. Not a bit. It never did him no harm, what I could see, and always more agreeable when he had a drop in. When he was out of work, my mother used to give him four pence and tell him to go out and not come back until he drunk himself cheerful and loving like. There's lots of women has to make their husbands drunk to make them fit to live with. Here,、yeah. what are you sniggering at? The new small talk. You do it so awfully well.、Oh, have I said anything I oughtn't? Not at all, Miss Doolittle. Well, that's a mercy, anyhow. What I always say <coughs> is, well, I must go. 
so pleased to have met you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Colonel Pickering. Goodbye, Miss Doolittle. Goodbye, all. Are you walking across the park, Miss Doolittle? If so, walk. I... Not bloody likely. I'm going in a taxi. Tape script two point five. One. Poor Eliza was shabbily dressed in a tatty old coat and hat. Two. The return of the actor Daniel Craig to the London stage is eagerly awaited. Three. She was bitterly disappointed when she didn't get the part. Four. I work with a highly motivated sales team. We all work hard. Five. It's virtually impossible to get seats for the match with Chelsea. Six. I desperately need a holiday. I haven't had a break for three years. Seven. Bad weather has severely affected the roads this weekend. Driving conditions are treacherous. Eight. Don't you get it? It's blindingly obvious that he's in love with you. Nine. I hate this cold climate. I'm sorely tempted to emigrate. Ten. I distinctly remember telling you not to phone me after ten o'clock. Eleven. Two people survived the crash with serious injuries, but unfortunately, one man was fatally injured. Twelve. I've made my views on the subject of politicians perfectly clear. I don't trust any of them. Tape script two point six. One. You must have some breakfast. You'll be starving by lunchtime. I have had breakfast. I had some delicious brown wholemeal bread with honey. Two. There's been a break-in at the National Gallery. Did they get much?、Uh, I don't think so. It just says here, thieves stole a priceless 19th-century impressionist painting, but it doesn't say which one. Three. Whoa! Did you see what happened to Camilla? No, I didn't. What happened to dear Camilla? Well, she was wearing some divine white crop designer jeans, and the waiter spilt red wine all over them. She was absolutely livid. I bet. Four. Don't you think it's time we got a new car? This one's clapped out. Listen, I like my little old second-hand mini, and it's not clapped out yet. Five. You look wet and cold. Well, we went on an exhausting six-mile coastal walk in the rain. Worth it, though. The views were stunning. Hmm, my idea of hell. Six. How come you turned him down? Where do I begin? First off, he smokes revolting, fat, smelly Havana cigars. Need I say more? Seven. I've never heard of Philippa Gregory. Really, she's just written a great new historical novel, and loads of her stuff is adapted for TV. Hmm. I guess historical novels just aren't my kind of thing. Eight. Did you go round to meet the new neighbours? I did. They're settling in well. They've just bought an amazing, massive HD TV. It almost fills one wall, and it turns itself on when you speak to it. What? How on earth does it do that? Tape script two point seven. Jemima J. by Jane Green. Chapter one. God, I wish I were thin. I wish I were thin, gorgeous, and could get any man I want. You probably think I'm crazy. I mean, here I am sitting at work on my own with a massive double-decker club sandwich in front of me. But I'm allowed to dream, aren't I? 
Half an hour to go of my lunch break. I finish my sandwich and look furtively around the office to see whether anyone is looking. It's okay. The coast is clear. So I can pull open my top drawer and sneak out the slab of chocolate. Ah, another day in my humdrum life. But it shouldn't be humdrum. I'm a journalist, for God's sake. Surely that's a glamorous existence. I love the English language, playing with words. But sadly, my talents are wasted here at the Kilburn Herald. I hate this job. When I meet new people and they ask what I do for a living, I hold my head up high and say, I'm a journalist. I then try to change the subject. The inevitable question after that is, who do you work for? I hang my head low, mumble the Kilburn Herald, and confess that I do the top tips column. Every week I'm flooded with mail from sad and lonely people in Kilburn with nothing better to do than write in with questions like, what's the best way to bleach a white marbled lino floor? And I have a pair of silver candlesticks. The silver is now tarnished. Any suggestions? And every week, I sit for hours on the phone, ringing lino manufacturers, silver makers, and ask them for the answers. This is my form of journalism. Ben Williams is the deputy news editor. Tall and handsome. He is also the office Lothario. Ben Williams is secretly fancied by every woman at the Kilburn Herald, not to mention the woman in the sandwich bar who follows his stride longingly as he walks past every lunchtime. Ben Williams is gorgeous. His light brown hair is casually hanging over his left eye, his eyebrows perfectly arched, his dimples when he smiles in exactly the right place. He is the perfect combination of handsome hunk and vulnerable little boy. Tape Script 2.8 1. We couldn't help laughing. It was too funny for words. <laughs> I know, but it was her worst nightmare, wearing the same dress as someone else at a posh do like that. Two. I think he's boring. He has nothing to say for himself. He may be a man of few words, but I think he's worth listening to. Three. Pam just prattles on and on, usually about herself. You can't get a word in edgeways. I know. I thought she'd never shut up. Four. Come on. You know you can trust me. What? Trust you again? You're kidding. You don't know the meaning of the word. Five. I've got the latest Apple iPad Air. It's the last word in tablets. I love it. <laughs> Lucky you. You always have the latest thing. Six. No, I don't want anything for it. I don't need two computers. You can have it. That's so kind of you. I'm lost for words. I can't thank you enough. Seven. Well, <laughs> not to mince my words, I don't think you stand a chance of getting that job. Huh. Thanks for your vote of confidence. Eight. You said I had no chance. Well, you'll have to eat your words. I got the job. You didn't. More fool me. You must be cleverer than I thought. Nine. I reckon selfie is the latest buzzword. It's even in the Oxford Dictionary now. Yeah, I can believe it. Everybody's taking selfies. I've just bought a selfie stick. Ten. This is just between you and me. Don't breathe a word to anyone else. I won't tell a soul. I promise. Unit 3. Enough is enough. Tape script 3.1.
World Watch Quiz. One. UN experts estimate that the total number of children in the world will remain at around two billion throughout this century. After a long period of constant increase, this peak level was reached at the end of the 20th century, as the average global fertility rate dropped from five babies per woman in 1950 to 2.5 in 2000. Two. Tragically, seven million of the 135 million children born each year die before the age of five. But the good news is that this is a huge drop to one in twenty. This will not cause faster population growth, as women are more likely to limit the size of their families when child mortality drops. Three. The average life expectancy globally is 70 years. As recently as 50 years ago, it was 60, and most of the longer lives were being lived in developed countries. Today, the average of 70 years applies to the majority of the world's population. Four. Today, 80% of adults in the world are literate. The biggest recent improvements in education have taken place for girls. In poorer countries, such as Bangladesh, there are now as many girls attending primary and secondary schools as boys. Five. A family in extreme poverty cannot be sure of having enough food to eat on a daily basis. Figures from the World Bank show that the number of people living in extreme poverty has fallen. From two billion in 1980 to just over one billion today. Six. In surveys over recent decades, self-assessment of where people feel they are on the happiness scale has resulted in slightly lower scores than half a century ago, despite significant increases in living standards. Seven. During the first 12 years of this century, the average level of debt per adult increased by 45 percent. In some countries, the UK, for example, it doubled. Eight. The richest 10 percent in the world own 86 percent of global wealth. At the top of the pyramid, the concentration of wealth increases further. With the top one percent owning just over fifty percent of global assets. Tape script three point two, limits to growth. Part one. Hello, welcome again to Money Matters. Now we've had a few emails from listeners asking us to discuss the topic of economic growth. Margaret Bentley from Surrey writes: "It's disappointing to hear the economy has grown less than expected, but why do economies need to keep on growing?" And David Adams from Newcastle says: "Politicians are always promising to get the economy back to normal growth rates, but surely our economy can't carry on growing forever." Well. I'm pleased to say we've got two people in today who are well placed to discuss this issue. Tony Adams is head of the Centre for Economic Policy. Hello. And Helen Armitage works for a think tank called Alternative Economies. Hello. Tony, can you make the case for economic growth? Well, um, <laughs> basically, just to maintain current living standards, the economy has to grow as fast as the population. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't keep up, there isn't enough work for everyone, and that means rising unemployment. But we want to keep improving living standards, not just maintain them, especially for the poorest in society. And the only way we can lift people out of poverty is through economic growth. <laughs> That's not strictly true, though, is it? <laughs> Uh, politicians want economic growth because it allows them to say they'll make the poor richer without having to make the rich any poorer. Without economic growth, we have to start looking at the issue of income redistribution, letting the poor have a bigger slice of the cake. Of course, the people at the top are keen to avoid that, so they just keep trying to make the cake bigger and bigger. Right. Would you agree that growth is a way to avoid doing anything about inequality, Tony? Well, of course, we need to avoid wealth redistribution if it means higher taxes on the rich. 
that reduces their motivation to invest and so the economy then grows even less mm -hmm. we need to give everyone in society the opportunity to be better off and that's what economic growth makes possible isn't that true helen that growth keeps everyone happy you mean a rising tide lifts all boats that's such a familiar idea, along with the famous trickle-down effect. But growth in recent decades hasn't reduced inequality. It's made it worse. Statistics show that the poorest in society haven't benefited. The tide seems to have lifted only the big yachts, not all the boats. Well, it certainly made a huge difference in developing countries. The gap between rich and poor countries is much smaller than it used to be. Most of the world's population now live in middle-income countries. Yes, but the inequality within countries has continued to increase. And anyway, it's wrong to assume that economic growth automatically leads to greater happiness. <laughs> that may be true for the very poor, when you really don't have enough, more is definitely good. But overall, we've seen our economies grow 24 times bigger in the last century, and we're beginning to realise it hasn't made us that much happier. Studies show that at a certain level of income, the connection between more income and greater happiness disappears. Yes, I've heard that. <laughs> and it starts to happen at a surprisingly modest level of income, too. Yeah, but you're arguing against basic human psychology here. People always want more. They always have, they always will. Yes. Huh? You see lots of relatively well-off people doing the lottery. <laughs> Uh, why is that? <laughs> because they can't help thinking that buying more stuff will make them feel happier. It's what our society encourages us to believe. Just look at all the adverts on TV. But if we stop to think about what gives us greatest fulfilment, does it always involve consumption? <laughs> If you want to see what really makes you feel happier, go for a long walk in the countryside with a friend. <laughs> Try watching a sunset one day this week. Organise a ball game with some friends in the park. Yeah, yeah, it all sounds very nice. But people won't stop wanting to buy more gadgets that will make their lives easier and more fun. Do gadgets really do that, though? Tape script 3.3 Part 2. So, Helen, are you saying that we need to have less growth or no growth at all? Well, the idea of endless economic growth is obviously a delusion. <sighs> economic growth of 2.5% a year sounds modest, but it means that GDP has to double every 30 years or so. You can't keep doing that forever. It's common sense. Uh, common sense told us... We couldn't carry on growing as much as we have in the last 50 years. That's because we couldn't have predicted the technological advances that have made it possible. And who knows what technology we might develop in the future. And you think, Tony, that that will solve the problem of limited resources? Well, yes, I do. We keep finding ways to use energy and resources more efficiently. Refrigerators now use half the energy they did 35 years ago. Family cars use half the fuel they did in the 1970s. Fine, but we can't expect to keep making such huge improvements in efficiency. Our resources will remain limited, and that makes the idea of eternal growth a form of insanity. <sighs> uh, look at those images of the Earth from space, and it becomes blindingly obvious. The last year that the global economy was at a level the planet could support was 1983. We're now exceeding that capacity by more than 30%. Yeah, well, you know, I remain an optimist. <laughs> What's the alternative? Hmm? No growth means more unemployment and less social spending because of lower tax revenues. And if the environment needs protecting, no growth means having less money to spend on doing that. <laughs> yes. Well, perhaps you should say something about the alternative, Helen. <laughs> the alternative is the steady state economy. And even the great-grandfather of capitalism, Adam Smith, talked about it. He thought that once everyone had reached a reasonable standard of living, our economies would stop growing and reach a steady state. He assumed people would then prefer to spend more of their time on non-economic activities, things like art and leisure and child-rearing. Yeah, well, good luck with that. 
It's the happily unemployed fantasy. Fine until you need some money to do something nice with your family. No, it doesn't mean being unemployed. There would be less work available, but it can be shared out, so we all do fewer hours a week. And as I said, the extra time can bring us much greater happiness. But, but people would have much less income. Yes, but that's not such a problem if people accept they'll have to consume a lot less anyway. Uh, we could still buy new stuff, but we'd have to get used to buying a lot less of it and keeping it for longer. It means getting things repaired more instead of throwing them away and getting a new one. Uh, that's the way we used to live not so very long ago. Well, I just can't see it, I? Well, I can, so maybe I'm the optimist. Huh. And I think it's interesting to ask ourselves what we really want from life. Why are we hooked on producing and buying so much needless stuff? Why do we fill our lives with so much work that we don't have time to enjoy them? It's not as if we ever meant to create such a stressful way of life. So now's the time to look at doing things differently. You see managing without economic growth as a positive challenge, then? Yes. We can't go back to the growth rates of recent decades, but it needn't be a depressing prospect. Exploring the alternatives can be exciting. We just need to give up the idea that consumerism is the central purpose of life. Well, thank you both. <laughs> that is definitely an issue that isn't going to go away. Tape Script 3.4 Spending on new cars rises sharply when people are in their 20s and presumably starting work. There's then a slight fall until midlife, when there is a steady increase in people in their 40s and 50s buying new cars, perhaps men having their midlife crisis. Spending then drops back again to level off for 70-year-olds, before plunging sharply after people turn 80, when people are probably not so bothered about what they drive, if they're still driving at all. Script 3.5 The name Maria was reasonably popular in the 1880s, with just under 1,000 babies per million being given it. In the 1890s, its popularity rose steadily to just below 1,500, and between the 1900s and 1920s, it soared to over 2,500 before dropping again to around 2,000 in 1940. The popularity of the name fluctuated over the next five decades, going up to 2,800 in 1960 and dropping again to 2,000 in 1980. There was then a sharp increase, up to over 3,000 between 1980 and 1990. There was a slight decrease to 3,000 during the 1990s, and the number of babies given the name Maria then plunged back to 2,000 by the end of the first decade of the 21st century. It is currently ranked as the 92nd most popular name for girls. Tape Script 3.6 1. This music's great, isn't it? Turn it up. I can't hear it. Two. <laughs> Kids, quieten down. Oh, Jeff, let them be. They're just letting off steam. Three. Why aren't you going out much these days? I need to save up for a car. Four. What's happened since your company got taken over? They've cut down my hours. Five. Speed up. It's a 70 mile an hour zone. It isn't. You can only do 60 on this road. Six. Oh, slow down. My legs are tired. We'll never get to the youth hostel before dark if we don't get a move on.
Tape script 3.7 1. What will you do if you get made redundant? I'll set up my own business. 2. What happened after the scandal broke? The president stood down. 3. It's such a lovely day. What shall we do this afternoon? Let's fire up the barbecue. 4. What effect did it have on you, having to spend so much time abroad? My marriage broke down. 5. My laptop's so slow to boot up. Try uninstalling programs that you never use. 6. The chemists shut down. I'm not surprised. It always seemed empty. Tape script 3.8 1. I'm not talking to you until you say sorry. Oh, grow up and stop acting like a child. 2. I don't know why Diana hasn't replied to any of my texts this week. Oh, you need to wake up and smell the coffee. It's obvious she isn't interested in you anymore. 3. I've been ill, but I couldn't take much time off work. Ah, uh, you do look a bit run down. 4. Thank you all for coming in your lunch break. I want to talk to you about the... Speak uh... up! We can't hear at the back. 5. I'm going to lose again. It's so depressing. Oh, lighten up, will you? It's just a game. 6. How did you manage to drop my tablet? Oh, no. The screen is all cracked. Calm down. I'll pay for the repair. 7. Have you worked out what for a cross is? It's one of the best crossword clues ever. It's too difficult. I give up. What's the answer? 8. You promised you would get this report done by today. I know. I'm sorry. I've let you down. 9. I just don't want to confront her about it. I'm scared of her. Man up, Tim, and stop being a wimp. 10. Have you heard the company's been taken over? No one seems to think it will change anything much. The management's playing it down, but it is bad news. Tape script 3.9 1. Going forward, we're hoping to grow the business by at least 10% over the next year. 2. Jenny, can I task you with actioning all the points we've agreed in this meeting? 3. This research phase is going to be mission critical on this project, so I want to make sure that everyone is following best practice. 4. Supporting these charities will impact our tax situation positively and also get us some great publicity. It's a win-win situation. Tape script 3.10. Buzzword bingo. OK, I thought I'd touch base and bring you up to speed on our bid to win the Delco advertising campaign. I know this is on all your radars, and as you know, this is mission critical in terms of our attempt to grow the business this year. If we're proactive on this one, and our bid is successful, it will impact our public profile in a big way and bring us serious bonuses. A win-win situation. I'm pleased to see that Jeff's team have hit the ground running on this. I don't want to drill down into the ideas they've come up with so far, but let's just say they're certainly thinking outside the box, and I know Jeff will go the extra mile to get this contract. If any of you decide you've got something to bring to the table on this, give me a heads up, and I'll task you to action any good ideas you come up with.
Going forward, we need to apply best practice throughout this bid, and if there are any new developments, you can be sure I'll keep you all in the loop. Danny, you don't look well. Are you feeling okay? Tape script three point eleven. Sara. It's the macho action hero ones that get on my nerves most. Don't worry, it's on my radar. Uh, actually, no, you don't have a radar because you're not a fighter pilot, and the upcoming presentation at the sales conference isn't really a potentially mortal threat. And before you tell me this is mission critical, we sell photocopier paper and don't tend to go on many missions. <laughs> oh, there seems to be a desire to be associated with the heavy engineering boys too. My boss has started asking me to drill down when he wants me to give him more information on something. And growing the business has become incredibly common, but it still sounds odd to me. I can only think of vegetables when someone talks about growing things. <sighs> Hit the ground running is all right, though. I quite like that image because it's great when it does feel like that when you start a new project. And go the extra mile is something I often do for my customers, and I'm fine with it being described like that. Things like that and bring you up to speed sound like perfectly normal language to me. The danger with all of them is that if you hear someone say exactly the same thing many, many times, <laughs> you switch off. Danny, I can't stand all this verbing of nouns. Could you action this for me? As if could you do this for me doesn't sound impressive enough. <laughs> At least it's short, though. The ones that use an excessive number of words annoy me most. I'll keep you in the loop. Why not just keep you informed? Going forward is redundant most of the time. Or you could just say in future. The only reason for using all this gobbledygook is the pathetic idea that it makes you sound like some high-flying managerial hotshot. But it can actually make you sound like a moron if you use too much of it. Some of the shorter ones can be useful.、Um, best practice means what it says and is neat, and proactive is a good thing to be in business. I think a win-win situation has a really good feel to it, and I'm actually okay with think outside the box because、uh, in itself it means something that I really like to do. It's just been overused so much, and the kind of person who uses it is usually stuck inside a box labelled. I copy what everyone else says. <laughs> Unit five: Culture clashes. Tape script five point one. One. Goodness! Did you see that sign? What on earth does it mean? No idea. Do you think there's a river at the bottom of this hill? Yeah, a river full of crocodiles. <laughs> yes, but it seems they only eat people in wheelchairs. <laughs> Weird. Well, we'll see. Two. You're holding everyone up. Look, I'm new to this. I I can't see how to read the sign. I, I can't make sense of it. How can I hold my poles and do that at the same time? It's not possible. Well, everyone else can manage it. Yeah, ow, ow. Oh! Oh! I give up. I'm going up on the cable car. Good idea. You do that. Three. Careful! It's a built-up area. You're going too fast. I am not. You are. We've just gone over another one. I nearly hit my head on the roof. Take them more slowly. I am. You're not. Oh. Oh. Thank goodness for that. We're on the open road again. <sighs> Four. 
four. Hey, slow down. I want to look out for ostriches. Huh? Ostriches? You won't see any here. Well, that sign said we might. No, it didn't. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't an ostrich. Well, it looked like one to me. Five. Ugh, look at these traffic queues. Lines. Remember we're in the States. Okay, okay. I told you it wasn't a good idea to set out in the rush hour. Don't I told you so, me? Just tell me which line to join. N not that one. We're paying cash. Why not? I think it's a drive through lane. Try that one over there. Yeah. Oh. <sighs> okay, okay. This is the right one. Six. Why would that be banned? Well, obviously it's bad for you. But it's just a nut. Not just any nut. I believe it's addictive and carcinogenic, and it makes your teeth red. Ew. Didn't you see that guy in that cafe we stopped at? His whole mouth was red. Yeah, I saw that, but I thought he must have bleeding gums and just needed a trip to the dentist. Tape script 5.2 Papua New Guinea Papua New Guinea is located in the southwest Pacific Ocean, just north of Australia. Its population currently stands at approximately 7.5 million. This is made up of over 700 different tribes. Many of these are in the isolated mountainous interior, or the rainforest, and therefore have little contact with one another, let alone with the outside world. This is one of the reasons why Papua New Guinea is linguistically the world's most diverse country, with over 800 languages spoken, 12% of the world's total. 82% of its people live in rural areas with few or no facilities or influences of modern life. Cannibalism and headhunting were widely practiced until as recently as the 1950s, and polygamy is still part of the culture. It is still possible to buy a wife with seashells or pigs. Papua New Guinea has strong ties with its southern neighbour, Australia, which administered the territory until independence in 1975. The government is led by an elected Prime Minister in the National Parliament, but as the country is a member of the Commonwealth of Nations, Queen Elizabeth II is its head of state. Tape script 5.3 1. I tried to repair my car, but I couldn't. It needs a mechanic. 2. You look awful. Why don't you see a doctor? Oh, I did. He just gave me some pills and told me to take things easy. 3. Have you read this report? Uh, no, I haven't, but I will. Four. My car's being serviced at the moment. If it wasn't, I'd give you a lift. Sorry. Five. I'm so glad you told Sue exactly what you thought of her, because if you hadn't, I certainly would have. Six. I think I'll give Rob a ring. You should. You haven't been in touch with him for ages. Seven. I went to a party last night, but I wish I hadn't. It was awful. 8. My boyfriend insists on doing all the cooking, but I wish he wouldn't. It's inedible. 9. Aren't you going to Portugal for your holidays? Well, we might, but we're still not sure. 10. Andy got drunk at Anne's party and started insulting everyone. He didn't. Oh, that's so typical of him. Tape script 5.4 1. You met my sister last night. Yes, I did. She thought we'd met before, but we... We hadn't. 2. It's a long journey. Take care on the motorway. Don't worry. We... We will. Three.
Come on, John. It's time you were getting up. Stop yelling at me. I... I am. Four. The weather forecast said that it might rain this afternoon. Well, we'll have to call off the tennis if it... If it does. Five. Did you get that job you applied for? Yes, I did. And I really didn't think I... I would. Tape script 5.5. One. Can you come round for a meal tonight? Thanks very much. I'd love to. Two. Did you post my letter? Oh, I'm really sorry. I forgot to. Three. I can't take you to the airport after all. Sorry. But you agreed to. Four. Was John surprised when he won? He certainly was. He didn't expect to. Five. Why did you slam the door in my face? It was an accident. I really didn't mean to. Six. You'll be able to enjoy yourself when the exams finish. Don't worry. I intend to. Tape script 5.6. Mark's been to America and so have I. He likes travelling, and I do too. He doesn't speak Russian, and neither do I. He isn't married, and nor am I. He can't drive, and I can't either. Things different. He's tried windsurfing, but I haven't. He comes from a big family, but I don't. He didn't see the football match, but I did. He hasn't been to Australia. I have, though. Tape script 5.7 Don't log off with Alan Dine Part 1 Hello? Hello! Hello, is this Brian? Yes, this is Brian. Hi, how are you? I first spoke with Brian 18 months ago. I dedicate my lunch hour normally to uh, chat with my uh, girlfriend, Anna, that I met online. I was just browsing profiles in Russia, <laughs> and I stumbled across the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> but this was more than just a typical online romance. Do you speak Russian? No, I'm learning to speak Russian. And does Anna speak English? No, not yet. She's trying to learn English, too. <laughs> so I began to chat with her using uh, Google Translator. That's how the relationship continued. Brian and Anna relying on online translation to communicate. I say that you were both lost in translation, but in fact you're, you found each other through translation. <laughs> this was the first of numerous conversations with Brian. Hello? Hello, Brian. The next time, he'd been to visit Anna in Russia. Was, uh, something, let me tell you. It took me over 24 hours just to get there. Did you feel that it all was exactly how you thought it would be in your mind? Oh, yes. The physical, spiritual, mental connection, everything was there. Six months later. Hello? Hello, Alan. Brian had some big news for me. We just decided we were going to get married and... Anna and her two children will be leaving Russia and moving to America. And the amazing thing is, this whole relationship is still relying on online translation. Neither Brian nor Anna speak each other's languages. She's left the only home she's ever known all her life, basically. Anna and her children were on their way. She's coming to a country where she's never been. She's never even been on an airplane before. I spoke with Brian at the airport on the night of their arrival. She should be here any minute, but it had to have landed. They were all going to come over on a three-month visa. Oh, there's some people coming up the escalator here. Anna has to get married to Brian within those three months. Otherwise, Anna and the children have to return to Russia. And I still don't see... You guys coming from New York? No. <gasps> here she is! 
There she is. I missed her. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I missed you too. Oh. <laughs> She's here. <laughs> Roya, this is a very special moment. Yes. Okay, well, she just told me to get off the phone. <laughs> so, Alan, well, Brian, may I wish you good luck, and I look forward to catching up with you shortly. Okay. Uh, you can call me in the next few days, probably. And it was then that I had an idea. I was thinking it would be a wonderful experience to visit you and Anna in Boise, Idaho. Oh, wow. To see you in person and to kind of capture your life with Anna now. That would be, that would be, uh, that would be interesting, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you never know, that might fit in to your wedding plans. Yes, I, I, th I think it would be, uh, definitely uh, take it up to the next level. Brian set the wedding date for the 21st of September. And I booked the plane tickets so I could be there. But then okay. um, I received a rather worrying message. Um, so this is really big news. Tape script 5.8. Part 2. So this is really big news. Um, the wedding that was planned for Saturday the 21st of September is now off. Hello. Brian, I got your message. Um, it's big news. It's a little bit difficult, but uh, yeah. well, unfortunately we haven't made a lot of arrangements. Tell me how you both made the decision to postpone the wedding. I think the 21st was just a little bit too soon for her. <laughs> She's been through a lot. She came halfway around the world. She's only been here just about a month and a half now. Just a little shy of a month and a half. And, and I think maybe perhaps uh, things may not be as nice as she'd imagine. You know, what is the cutoff point, Brian? October twentieth, I think, would probably be the ninety-day cutoff. The clock is ticking, isn't it, Brian? Yes, and I, I, I hope that she doesn't have second thoughts. But wedding or no wedding, the plane tickets have been bought. Boarding the plane, I had no idea quite how this story would unfold. Fifteen hours later. And here I am, breathing Idaho air. Hi Anna, how are you? Fine, thanks. It soon becomes clear to me that it's not been easy for Anna in these first few months in the US. Right now, she really hasn't been anywhere by herself. She's always had me with her. Well, so when you're at work? When I'm at work, she pretty much stays at home. Can you understand that? I can, I can understand. She has been through a big change I don't want to add any stress <laughs> to her life. Tape script 5.9 Part 3 What have you got in that bag, Brian? This is uh, our wedding ring. Brian and Anna are getting married. They've decided to go ahead with the wedding. But it's not quite the big day that Brian had originally planned. It's going to be a very low-key affair in the courthouse. It's all very casual. Both Anna and Brian are wearing jeans. It's an empty courtroom. The only people present at the wedding are Brian and Anna, Anna's eight-year-old son, Ivan, myself, my producer and the interpreter. 
I promise, I promise to be true to, to you. To be true to you. In good times. And good times. And in bad. And in bad. And then Brian had a surprise for us. Alan Bean. Both myself and my producer Lawrence were called upon to be official witnesses at the wedding. And here? Yep. I can't quite believe that from a random Skype conversation almost two years ago Sign there. that I'm now in Boise, Idaho, signing Brian and Anna's wedding certificate. There's my signature. You're all set. You have witnessed. I have witnessed the wedding of Brian and Anna. Uh, there's a copy of your back. A wedding that would never have taken place without the advent of online translation. I do. I do. Tape script 5.10. Peter. I'm from Oxford, and a few years ago I went to work in Prague, and uh, on my very first day there I set off to walk to work, and uh, I came to this butcher's shop, and I casually glanced at the special offers board on the pavement outside. <laughs> uh, I couldn't believe my eyes. It read, Zebra, 65 crowns per kilogram. <laughs> For me, this was a big cultural difference. I'm no vegetarian and I'll eat almost any meat. I've no problem with veal or rabbit, but I do draw the line at endangered species. So I checked the board again and it really did say zebra. I felt sick. I worried about it all the way to work. I'd always thought the Czechs were a civilised nation and uh, I wasn't sure what perturbed me the most, the idea of eating zebra or the fact that it was so cheap. 65 crowns was about £1.25. That's a kilo of zebra meat for less than a copy of a Sunday newspaper. Anyway, I got to my work and I introduced myself to the pretty young Czech receptionist. And I just had to find out if Czechs really did eat zebra. So I said... What's check for zebra? Zebra, she said. Why? Oh, dear. I was horrified. So I asked, and uh, it's a check delicacy? No, she said. Of course not. Why? Well, outside the butchers, it said zebra, 65 crowns per kilogram. She started laughing, and finally she said, Did the Z have a hat check? A what? I said. A little hook, like this, above the Z. And she drew it for me. You see, zebra is check for zebra, but zebra, with a hat check above the Z, means ribs. And she pointed at her midriff to show me. I felt really foolish, but very relieved. The Czechs really are a civilised bunch after all. So much so that I'm still here eight years later and I'm married to Lenka. She's the pretty young receptionist. Sarah. I'm half Korean and half British, so I have a kind of dual identity. I was born in Seoul in South Korea, but I've lived in England for years. And now I find whenever I go back to Korea, I'm faced with some unique cultural differences. I suppose I look about 80% uh, Korean and 20% British. And Korean people are often a bit puzzled as to why I look slightly different from them. And one day the funniest thing happened in this respect. I was in a department store in Seoul, just browsing through some clothes, and this woman came up to me and she grabbed me by the arm and said, Oh, please tell me, where did you get your nose done? <laughs> and I just looked at her and said, What? What do you mean? And I tapped my nose and felt very self-conscious. <laughs> then it struck me because... Actually, in Korea, plastic surgery is quite a routine procedure. It's very common. There are plastic surgeons on every street corner. So this lady just assumed, because my nose is a bit larger than usual, um, that I must have had plastic surgery done. I just said to her, oh, no, no, sorry. Actually, my father gave me this nose. He's British.
Marie Law. I find it's not at all exotic to be French here in London, but being English in Paris is still quite exotic, I think. And what are some of the cultural differences I found living here? Well, quite a few. The usual food differences. There's not a baker on every corner, and okay, I like crisps, but in the supermarkets there are aisles of them in every flavor imaginable: prawn, vinegar, chicken, chili, on and on. Who needs them all? <laughs> oh, <laughs> and the English obsession with house prices. Yes. They have endless conversations about the prices of houses. Everyone wants to own a house, and what's weird to me is the way that they quantify the size of a house by giving the number of bedrooms and bathrooms, not its actual size in square feet or meters. Oh, and something else. I find it odd to leave a doctor's surgery without a prescription as long as your arm, or with nothing at all. That was a first for me. <laughs> Ethan, I'm Australian, and about six years ago, I spent two years living and working in Burma. Every day, I'd catch a taxi to my work. Anyway,、uh, one day. Long after I arrived there, I got into this taxi—a beautiful, clean, shiny taxi. I sat down and、uh, I put my feet. Well, <laughs> it was difficult to find anywhere to put my feet, but <laughs> I didn't look down, and the taxi started moving. Luckily, quite slowly. Suddenly, I found my feet because they'd started sort of running. It was the weirdest feeling. <laughs> I looked down, and my feet were actually on the road. And they had to run to keep up with the taxi. I looked again and saw a huge rusted hole in the floor of the taxi. My feet had gone straight through it. Quick as a flash, I pulled them back inside and positioned them firmly either side of the hole. But after that, I noticed that a lot of the taxis had problems. They were really ancient cars, but their owners were really proud of them and kept them in beautiful condition where they could. But some things, like doors or floors, they couldn't replace. I couldn't imagine taxis like these being allowed in Sydney. There didn't seem to be any health and safety regulations in Burma, but the taxis did their job just fine. Maybe it's different now. Tape script five point eleven. Conversation A. Who's the package for? Nancy. It's her birthday on the weekend. Yeah, I know. What did you get her? A beautiful brown leather purse. Awesome! She'll love it. I got her a gorgeous cashmere sweater. She's a lucky girl. I want to mail it to her. Do you have her address? I do, but I don't have the zip code. Conversation B. Who's the parcel for? Nancy. It's her birthday at the weekend. Yeah, I know. What have you got her? A beautiful brown leather handbag. Fabulous! She'll love it. I've got her a lovely cashmere jumper. She's a lucky girl. I want to post it to her. Have you got her address? I have, but I haven't got the postcode. Tape script five point twelve. One. Do you have the time? Yeah, it's five after four.、Uh, did you say five till? No, five after four. Two. What are you going to do on the weekend? The usual stuff: play soccer with my kids and rake the yard. Three. Did you have a good vacation? Yeah, real good. How long were you away? Five days in all, Monday through Friday. Four. Where do you live? We have a small apartment on the first floor of an apartment building downtown. Do you have a yard? No, we don't. Just a parking lot around the back. Five. Did you see Meryl Streep's new movie yet? Sure thing. She was awesome in it. She played this homely old woman who drifted around in her bathrobe all day. <laughs> yeah, she's a great actor. Six. Did they bring the check yet? Yeah, they just did. 
But I can't read a thing. It's so badly lit in here. You need a flashlight. 7. Do we need to stop for gas? Sure do. Anyways, I need to use the bathroom. 8. Did you enjoy the game? Yeah, it was great. But we had to stand in line for half an hour to get tickets. Tape script 5.13. 1. Have you got the time? Yeah, it's 5 past 4. Did you say 5 too? No, 5 past 4. 2. What are you going to do at the weekend? Oh, you know, the usual. Play football with my kids and do a bit of gardening. 3. Did you have a good holiday? Uh, yeah, really good. How long were you away? Five days altogether, from Monday to Friday. 4. Where do you live? We've got a small flat on the ground floor of a block of flats in the city centre. Have you got a garden? No, we haven't. Just a car park at the rear. 5. Have you seen Meryl Streep's new film yet? I have. She was terrific in it. She played this plain old woman who drifted around in a dressing gown all day. Yeah, she's a great actor. 6. Have they brought the bill yet? Yeah, they just have. But I can't read a thing. The lighting is so bad in here. You need a torch. 7. Do we need to stop for petrol? Yeah, why not? Anyway, I need to go to the loo. 8. Did you enjoy the match? Yeah, it was great. But we had to queue for half an hour to get tickets. Unit 6. Fruits of War. Tape script 6.1. 1. I came, I saw, I conquered. Was said by Julius Caesar, 100 BC to 44 BC. He was a Roman general who sent the famous message Veni Vidi Vici to the Roman Senate in 47 BC after a great military victory in Asia Minor, now known as Turkey. 2. Happiness lies in conquering one's enemies, in driving them in front of oneself, in taking their property, in savouring their despair, in outraging their wives and daughters. This was said by Genghis Khan, 1162 to 1227. He was the emperor and founder of the Mongol Empire. After his death, this became the largest empire in history. 3. You shall show no mercy. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. This is from the Old Testament in the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 19, verse 21. 4. Resist not evil, but whosoever shall strike thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other. This is from the New Testament in the Bible, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 38. 5. War does not determine who is right, only who is left. Said by Bertrand Russell, 1872 to 1970. Russell was a British philosopher, mathematician, historian and pacifist. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950. 6. The tragedy of modern war is that the young men die fighting each other, instead of their real enemies back home in the capitals. Said by Edward Abbey, 1927 to 1989. Abbey was an American author, essayist and anarchist, noted for his advocacy of environmental issues. 7. No one is born hating another person because of the colour of his skin or his background, or his religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. This was said by Nelson Mandela, 1918 to 2013. Mandela was a South African anti-apartheid revolutionary, politician and philanthropist.
In 1962, he was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment. He served over 27 years in prison. He was finally released in 1990 following an international campaign. He then served as President of South Africa from 1994 to 1999. 8. I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Said by Albert Einstein, 1879-1955, he was a German-born physicist who developed the general theory of relativity. In 1921, he received the Nobel Prize in Physics. 9. In war, truth is the first casualty. First said by Aeschylus, 525 BC to 456 BC. He was a Greek tragic dramatist. He is often described as the father of tragedy, being the first of the three ancient Greek tragedians whose plays are still read or performed the others being Sophocles and Euripides. 10. Mankind must put an end to war before war puts an end to mankind. Said by John F. Kennedy, 1917-1963, to the 35th President of the US. It was part of a speech to the United Nations General Assembly on the 25th of September, 1961. Tape script 6.2 A. I hate the waste of human life in war. What I hate about war is the waste of human life. The thing I hate about war is the waste of human life. It's the waste of human life that I hate. B. War changes people's lives forever. What war does is change people's lives forever. The thing war does is change people's lives forever. Something the war did was change people's lives forever. Tape script 6.3 1. The thing I can't stand about Bruce is the way he's always so full of himself. 2. It's his lack of self-awareness that amazes me. 3. What you don't appreciate is how exhausting travelling is. 4. Something that drives me mad is the number of security checks. 5. The thing that upset me was the way the customs officer behaved. 6. What I appreciated was the fact that all the nurses were so sympathetic. 7. Something that really annoys me is the way you're always late. 8. It's Peter who you should talk to. Tape script 6.4 1. What kind of holiday do you like? One thing I like is touring historic sites. 2. I like relaxing on a beach in the sun. What I like doing is touring historic sites. 3. You like adventure holidays, don't you? No, no. Touring historic sites is what I like. 4. You like going on cruises, don't you? No, it's touring historic sites that I like. 5. I know you hate touring holidays. Well, actually, touring historic sites is something I like. 6. You like cultural holidays, don't you? Yes! There's nothing I like more than touring historic sites. Tape script 6.5 Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Never have I seen such courage.
Rarely does one find such clear explanations. Had it not been for the war, women would not have got the vote. Finally, the war did end. Tape script 6.6 1. Something I've never told you is that I'm actually a secret agent. 2. What I can't stand about modern life is the number of choices you have to make. 3. What always surprises me is the way we always seem to end up doing what you want to do. 4. The thing that annoys me most is people who talk loudly into their mobiles in public places. Do they think it makes them look important? 5. It's not me who wanted to come to this dump on holiday. Cheap it may be, but there's nothing to do. 6. What the government should do is stop listening to focus groups and get on with governing. 7. Oh, never in my life have I been so pleased to see someone. Do you have a key to the front door? 8. What I did after class yesterday was just go home and chill. I was shattered. Tape script 6.7 1. Peter hasn't told anybody. He told me. 2. I hope you didn't tell Clara. I didn't tell anyone. 3. I invited Anna, but she isn't coming. I told you she wouldn't. 4. Who told Tim about it? I've no idea. I didn't tell anyone. 5. John won't like it when you tell him. If I tell him. 6. It's the worst film I've ever seen. Tell me about it. 7. He dumped me. I told you he would. 8. Have you heard the joke about the old man and his dog? I told you it. Tape script 6.8 Part 1 An extract from Oh What a Lovely War Hey, listen. Yeah, they're copping it down railway wood tonight. No, no, not that. Listen. What is it? Singing, isn't it? It's those Welsh bastards in the next trench. That's Jerry, that is. Yeah, it is Jerry. It's coming from over there. Sing up, Jerry. Let's hear you. Hey, they heard us. Hello? Hey? Happy Christmas. Oh, happy, happy Christmas. Christmas. Hey, yeah, it's Christmas. Tape script 6.9, part two. Graham Williams and Harold Startin's account of the Christmas truce. That scene from the West End musical of the 1960s, Oh What a Lovely War, is a pretty accurate illustration of the kind of thing that happened in several places on the Western Front on that Christmas Eve of 1914. Listen to the account of someone who was actually there. Graham Williams, a rifleman with the London Rifle Brigade, was on sentry duty that night. On the stroke of 11 o'clock, which by German time was midnight, because they were now ahead of us, 
lights began to appear all along the German trenches. And, uh, and then people started singing. And they started singing uh, Heiliger Nacht, Stern Nacht, Heiliger Nacht, this silent night. So I thought, well, this is extraordinary. And I woke up all the other chaps and all the other sentries must have done the same thing to come and see what was going on. And they sang this carol right through. And we responded with English Christmas carols. And they replied with German again. And we came to uh, Come All Ye Faithful. They joined in singing that with us, and they sing it in Latin, Adesti Fidelis. So by uh, the time you got to that carol, both sides were singing the same carol together? Both singing the same carol together. Then after that, one of the Germans called out, Come over and see us, Tommy, come over and see us. So I, I could speak German pretty fluently in those days. So I told back, I said, No, you come over and see us. I said, Nein, come and, to us, come and see Herr Fritz. And oh, well, nobody did come that time, and eventually the lights all burnt out, and quietened down and went on with the usual routine for the night. Next morning, I was asleep when I woke up. I found everyone was walking out into no man's land, meeting the Germans, and talking to them, and it was a wonderful scene, couldn't believe it. Further along the line, in the perfect weather, Private Harold Startin of the Old Contemptibles was enjoying that morning too. He couldn't speak any German, but that didn't stop him making friends. We would Tommy to them, and they were all fritz to us. If you'd have met your brother, you'd, they couldn't have been more cordial towards you, or sharing their goodies with you. They were giving us cigars, <laughs> not as big as your arm, and tobacco. Were you frightened at first? Were you suspicious at all? Because these were people no. that you'd been trained to hate, weren't they? No, there, there was no hatred. We'd got no grudge against them. They'd got no grudge against us. See, we were, we were the best of pals. Although we were there to kill one another, there were no two ways about that at all. They helped us bury our dead, and we've buried our dead with their dead. I've seen many a cross with a German name and number on, and a British name and number on. In death not divided. Did you do other work during the truce as well? Was it just burying the dead or were there other oh, things you there got were done? strengthening the trenches, borrowing their tools. You actually borrowed German tools we to strengthen German your trenches? We borrowed German tools. They'd lend it you. They'd come and help you strengthen your defences against them. Tape script 6.10 Part 3 how the truce ended. Not only was the truce more extensive than anyone has realised before, it also lasted much longer than has been believed until now. In some areas, the war started up again on New Year's Day, but in the part of the line where Harold Startin was, the truce lasted a lot longer than that. Ours went on for six weeks. You can read in the history books about Sir John French when he heard of it, he were all against it. But our truce went on for six weeks. And the Württemberg Regiment, they got relieved before we did. And they told us, they thought it was the Prussian Guards going to relieve them. And if it was, we should hear three rifle shots at intervals. And if we only heard three shots, we should know that the Prussian Guards that were opposite us then, and we'd got to keep down because they would be fiercer than the yes, Wittenbergers. Yes, yes. Can you remember particular Germans that you spoke to? Over six weeks, you must have made friends. I spoke to one. Otter comes from Stuttgart, as has been over to England to see me. So you made friends during the truce and kept in we touch after the war? We made friends during the truce and friends after. Goodbye. Goodbye, wipe the tear, baby dear, from your eye. Though it's hard to part, I know I'd be tickled to death to go. Don't cry, don't sigh. There's a silver lining in the sky. Bonsoir, oh, ding, cheerio, chin, chin, au revoir, toodle, goodbye.
Tape script 6.11 1. What colour do you call that? It says pale sunlight on the tin. Pale sunlight? It's more like dazzling daffodil. I can't wake up to that every morning. It'd give me a headache. I suppose it is a bit, uh, yellow. Oh dear. I just wanted a kind of sunny glow in our bedroom. Ah, oh, don't worry. I'm sure we can find a happy medium. Let's get some of those little trial pots from the paint shop. Two. We should have turned left there. Look, who's driving this car? The sat-nav said right. I know these streets better than any sat-nav. You do not. The sat-nav is never wrong. Huh. You don't believe that any more than I do. Well, I am not turning round. <sighs> OK, OK. Have it your own way, but don't blame me if we're late. Three. I haven't a clue who to vote for in the next election. They're all a load of... But you've got to vote. We can't let the other lot in. That's not how I see it. They're all as bad as each other. <laughs> I couldn't disagree more. Let the other lot in and taxes will rock it and prices will... Come on, that happens with all of them. Let's just agree to disagree, shall we? Mm. You and I mustn't fall out over this. <laughs> Four. Put that thing down. Huh? You spend your life in front of a screen. Hey, hang on a minute. Look who's talking. You never go anywhere without your iPad and iPhone. Yeah, but I'm not always checking them. You've lost the art of conversation. I have not. I really take offence at that. Well, I've been telling you about my day and you haven't heard a word. Huh? Sorry, what did you say? <sighs> Tape script 6.12 Life in Tudor, England. Hello, everybody. Um, the subject of my talk is Life in Tudor, England. Something that has always dismayed me when studying history is the concentration on wars and battles. So, what I'd like to talk to you about today is the lives of ordinary folk in England about 500 years ago. My interest in this period stems from childhood, when I used to spend holidays in my aunt's beautiful old farmhouse in Sussex. Um, it was built in 1490, when the Tudors ruled the country, and I would lie in bed at night and imagine what life must have been like then. However, when I started researching the period, I soon shed any romantic notions I had of it. In case you're not sure of your history, the Tudors ruled England from 1485 to 1603. The most famous examples of Tudor monarchs being Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. Towns then, other than London, were very small and overcrowded. The streets were narrow, cobbled and filthy, and very unhealthy. Open sewers carried the filth to the nearest river. Rats and flies thrived, spreading diseases such as typhus and plague. Few people lived beyond the age of 40, and children often died before they were five. Now, as you might imagine, it was a different story for the rich. They lived in mansions in the countryside, with anything up to 150 servants. Tudor houses are easily recognisable because of their numerous tall chimneys needed for their many fires. These not only kept the vast rooms warm, but they also cooked the food for their huge feasts. Feasts that would often consist of up to ten courses, and include such meats as wild boar, venison, roast tongue, and fowl such as peacocks, blackbirds, and sparrows. Now, three quarters of the Tudor diet was made up of meat. Potatoes were not introduced until the reign of Elizabeth I. Honey was what was normally used to sweeten food. Sugar was rarely available and a sign of great wealth. However, the poor seldom got to eat meat or taste sugar. They lived mainly off vegetables, such as cabbage and turnips, with an occasional caught rabbit or fish. Now, as for education, poor children didn't attend school. But those from better-off families sometimes had tutors to teach reading and French. Um, boys were often sent to grammar schools, 
and here they would learn mainly Latin in classes of up to 60. The school day was a long one, from dawn to dusk. There were only two universities in Tudor England, Oxford and Cambridge, and some boys went to university at the age of 14. For entertainment, while the rich went hunting or enjoyed fencing or jousting contests, the poor watched bear fighting. And um, they also played a kind of football where they jumped on each other, a sport which frequently led to broken bones. But, of course, something which was enjoyed by people of all backgrounds was the theatre, especially the plays of a young playwright called William Shakespeare. There is so much more I could say about the Tudors. I find their day-to-day -day lives fascinating and much more interesting than the wars they fought. Uh, I hope that you have found it interesting too. If anyone has any questions, I'll be pleased to try and answer them. Unit 7. Lighten up. Tape script 7.1. 1. I'm so fed up with living in this town. It's so boring. There's just nothing interesting to do here. And I wish we hadn't bought this house. It's gloomy. 2. Look, it really is time you cleaned your room. When are you going to do it? If I've asked you once, I've asked you a thousand times. 3. I was really upset when I didn't pass the university entrance exam, but I feel OK about it now. I guess it's not the end of the world. 4. I think it was appalling the way Selina behaved. I'm not interested in her excuses. She should be ashamed of herself. 5. OK, OK, you've made your point. Maybe I did behave badly this evening. 6. I'm not very good at explaining things to people. I'm impatient, and I get very frustrated if they don't understand straight away. 7. Everyone's saying how wonderful your presentation was. Derek says you're one of the best presenters he's ever seen. 8. Oh, I still don't know whether to take that job. I've hardly slept all night thinking about what to do. Do you really think I should take it? Tape script 7.2 1. I'd give Dave a lift again tomorrow if he hadn't made fun of my car this morning. 2. If you hadn't been sitting in that cafe when I walked in, we wouldn't be living together now. 3. If Carl had been born a week earlier, He'd be starting school next week. Four. We'd buy that house right now if the previous owner hadn't painted it pink. Five. If I didn't have bad eyesight, I would have trained as a pilot after I left college. Six. I would have posted Jilly's birthday present yesterday if I wasn't going to visit her next week. Tape script 7.3 Oh, this hotel is horrible. I wish we hadn't come here. I've never seen such a dirty place in my life. It wouldn't be so bad if the bathroom was clean, but it's filthy. I wouldn't even wash my socks in it. I know, but we've been driving for hours and I wanted to stop. If we hadn't, there mightn't have been another hotel for miles and we'd still be driving. I wish we'd set off earlier so we could have got to Cornwall today. We won't get there till tomorrow lunchtime now. I told you we'd need to leave in the morning, but you wouldn't listen. I had to finish some important work this morning. If I hadn't, we could have left earlier. Then we'd be sitting in a nice hotel on the coast, instead of this dump in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, it's time we had something to eat. If it wasn't so late... I'd suggest looking for a pub that does food, but I guess we'll have to eat here. Oh, I wish we didn't. It'll be awful, I'm sure. Oh, I wish you'd stop moaning. OK, I'm sorry. I guess we're both tired. Mm. Come on, 
Let's start enjoying the weekend. Tape script 7.4 1. There isn't very much, if any, chicken in this sandwich. Oh, it's all salad. I know. Mine's the same. I'd have ordered the vegetarian option if I didn't want meat. 2. We rarely, if ever, watch reality TV shows. We don't either. I find I get enough reality in everyday life. 3. He's a born loser if ever I saw one. Oh, that's a dreadful thing to say. He's just going through a difficult period in life. 4. You should find my house easily. If not, give me a ring and I'll give you directions. It's OK. I never find things easily myself, but my sat-nav usually does the job. 5. Joe seemed interested in the idea, if not exactly enthusiastic. Oh, I think she's very keen. She just doesn't show her feelings very much. 6. See if that dress fits you. If so, you should definitely buy it. You know, I think I might just do that. It's time I had some new clothes. 7. Creepy Colin asked me for a date. As if... Oh, come on. He's not that bad. I'd fancy him if he dressed a bit smarter. Tape script 7.5 the History of the Smile Part 1 The historian and author, Kate Williams, goes in search now of the modern, winning smile. W.C. Fields' advice might have been to start the day with a smile and get it over with, but the power of the smile should not be underestimated. The broad and confident smile is at the heart of our communication and central to how we interact with people in today's society. However, this hasn't always been the case, as Colin Jones, Professor of History at Queen Mary, University of London, explains. Since the Renaissance, there's been a tremendous emphasis on forms of politeness and civility which emphasise control. All that sort of conduct literature emphasises closure of the mouth. Of course one smiles at all sorts of circumstances. But the crucial thing is to control that smile and to keep the lips uh, firmly shut so that the mouth is closed and the teeth are undisplayed. Just because they were restrained doesn't mean they didn't have a good time. As a historian, I'm fascinated by how images of our ancestors as straight-faced and serious makes us think that they were dull. From Elizabeth I to Queen Victoria, it is almost as if we think those before us never smiled. Art critic Laura Cumming, author of A Face to the World, has examined smiles in portraiture from across the centuries. Most smiles that I can think of in portraiture are closed-lipped. It seems to me that that's quite significant. Clearly, teeth. Are an, are an issue in the medieval era um, and they become an issue very strongly with the arrival of sugar and in Flemish art in which there are lots of smiling portraits um, there's a, a suggestion that the open mouth smile is indicating speech and sometimes indicating age there are wonderful paintings Lucas Cranach and so on um, where the sitter is opening their mouth to show either rather beautiful flashy white teeth in which case they're showing their teeth off or they're showing the crumbling teeth like a faltering falling skyline most smiles closed professor colin jones feels there's one portrait in particular that has great significance in the history of the toothy smile we know today self-portrait in a turban with her child by the french court painter elizabeth louise vigie lebrun painted in 1786 and first shown a year later at the Louvre, where it still remains. It really crystallises the change, which has probably been going on in the previous years, about the meaning of the smile, the smile with the, an open mouth showing teeth uh, is. She's sitting in a very sort of casual way with her rather beautiful child on her lap, looking directly at the viewer with a very charming smile, and she's showing white teeth. It provokes quite a storm. There are people who write in uh, about this and say, this is quite radical, it's quite disgraceful that she's showing herself in this way. 
by focusing on the smile, I think we've definitely got something which is changing. It's something which uh, is, is a very significant moment, I think, in the representation of the smile in Western art. But it also is flagging up a change in the way that people think about the relationship between their smile and their basic identity. Vigilie Brun is not the first by any means. What she is, however, is the first to make a real style of it. What is also interesting about this smile is that it's flagging up Madame Vigie Le Brun is a woman who can afford a dentist. She could act as almost like an advertisement for uh, some of these Parisian dentists who are seen as, as Europe's greatest uh, practitioners in the 18th century or for the tooth powders or pastes and toothbrushes which are emerging uh, precisely at this time. Tape script 7.6 Part 2 the greatest single factor governing the development of modern smiling habits, apart from dentistry, was the invention of photography and, in due course, the invention of motion picture photography. The emergence of Hollywood studio shots, where the smile is seen as something which is absolutely vital to the person's charisma. It's really in the late 19th and definitely much more in the 20th century that the idea comes uh, forward that the informal shot, which can be picked up by instant photography, becomes a way in which individuals can register their individuality. We have our photographs taken all the time, weddings, Christmas, holidays, but it's actually quite difficult to get that perfect natural smile. So to find out how to look good on camera, I'm here in a photography studio in North London to meet the photographer Olivia Mann and we're going on a mission for the perfect natural smile. Yeah, great, that's fantastic. So Olivia, you specialise in wedding photography and when you're out there photographing the wedding, how do couples feel about smiling on their wedding day? I have brides coming to me and saying, well, I'm really worried about my crow's feet and if I smile too much, then that's going to make me look awful. <laughs> what is actually a nightmare for me is that if someone is worrying about their crow's feet, then what they tend to do is tighten up and clench all their facial muscles. So they actually look quite scary, which is the last thing you want in your wedding photographs. So, Olivia, I can't put it off any longer. I'm going to have my photograph taken. What would you do to say to get me to make that perfect natural smile? What I want you to do is just sit there for a moment and just start relaxing everything. Here, okay, first of all, um, your forehead. Everyone holds a lot of tension in their forehead. Really relax the muscles around your eyes and your cheekbones and just let your lips fall open. If you could just imagine a moment in your life where you felt particularly happy, confident and attractive. I'm in Italy, in a little village by the sea, and having a large plate of pasta, and it's beautiful weather, and I'm with friends, and it's just, it's just a wonderful evening. So now I want you to hold on to all of those feelings, but you're now in the studio and you're ready to be photographed. So open your eyes and let's go. That's absolutely lovely. You can just drop your chin a tiny touch. Yeah, that's the shot. That's lovely. Oh, I'd love to see it. So, can I have a look? Oh, that's great. That's fabulous. I love it. So, there's me thinking of Italy. I think I'm going to try this from now onwards. Every time I have to have my photograph taken, I'm going to start thinking about eating pasta in Italy by the sea. Tape script 7.7, .7, part 3. The profound transformation of whole societies by what can be achieved now in the dentist's chair is giving rise to completely new attitudes about what is beautiful and what is acceptable and what is desirable in our smile. So in a way, the medical and the cultural are travelling in parallel. One man who has our smiles literally in his hands is dentist Martin Fallowfield. So is there such a thing as a perfect smile? There are those who argue that the perfect smile is an imperfect smile. The very, very best technicians will be building in tiny irregularities when they're building a full mouth smile. This wall-to-wall -wall symmetrical dentistry that we're seeing actually doesn't look that good. 
So what's the future for our smiles? Bigger, whiter, wider? Angus Trumbull. If you look at the difference between Rita Hayworth and Julia Roberts, it is impossible not to be startled by an amplification. The dial on the meter marked smiling is being turned up and there's no reason to suppose that it will stop being turned up. It will get bigger, possibly fiercer, certainly whiter and possibly even broader. So one day we might be like the Cheshire Cat, big and smiley and the grin remains. Yes, and, and in that situation, a solemn or sombre person may strike us as not just bizarre, but mad. Tape script 7.8 1. You look tired. Well, I carried on reading that book till two in the morning. It was such a page-turner, I just had to find out how it ended. 2. Oh, no. I feel like I've heard this lecture before. I know. It is dragging on a bit, isn't it? His voice is so monotonous, too. Three. I finally managed to get away from Alan. He was going on and on about his new phone. I know. He's been wanting one of those for ages, though. So he's obviously excited about it. Four. Are you going to the school sports day? Of course I am. Sally might not win her race if I'm not there to cheer her on. Five. I think there's a chance I'll get let off for speeding if I tell them I was late for a really important medical appointment. Oh, yeah. Dream on. You think they haven't heard that one before? Six. Well, I guess we'd better crack on. Absolutely. It's nearly three o'clock and we're only halfway through. Tape script 7.9 1 Oh, it was such a drag that your barbecue got rained off. I was really looking forward to it. 2 These drugs really help my migraines, but they wear off after about four hours. And I don't want to keep taking more of them. Three. About a third of our workers were laid off in the company restructure. Four. I can't believe Denise has broken off her engagement. She seems so keen on Jason. Five. The fire service strike was called off at the last minute after industrial negotiations. Six. I went off meat for a while after visiting a factory farm on our school trip. It's enough to put anyone off. Tape script 7.10 1. So there isn't going to be a train strike now? No, it's been called off. 2. A lot of people are eating quinoa now, aren't they? Yes, it really seems to have caught on. 3. These painkillers don't work for very long, do they? No, they wear off after about three hours. 4. I thought you liked blue cheese. I did, but I've gone off it. Five. Do you fancy a cup of tea? Yes, I'll put the kettle on. Six. When does the heating start working? It comes on at nine o'clock. Seven. Was it too wet to finish your tennis match? Yes, it got rained off. Eight. How come you lost your job? I got laid off. Nine. Are you taking Susie to the airport? Yes, I'm going to see her off. Ten. 
Have you still not written that essay? No, I keep putting it off. Eleven. Oh, I thought that lecture would never end. It was so dull. Yes, it did drag on a bit. Twelve. Why can't you drive down the high street? Is it because of that awful traffic accident? Yes, the police have sealed off the area. Tape script 7.11. Oh, I got soaked when that huge wave came in. Never mind, it could be worse. At least you can dry off in the sun. Tape script 7.12. 1. The bank won't lend me any more money. I wish I'd never started my own business. Oh, cheer up. I'm sure it'll all work out all right in the end. 2. If only I'd never asked Lucy out. She said no, and it's really awkward working with her now. You'll soon get over it. And at least you tried. You know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. 3. I don't think I'm ever going to make it as an actor. I failed another audition this morning. It's not the end of the world. Hang on in there and stay positive. 4. Oh, I can't believe what I've done. I sent an email moaning about my boss to her by mistake. Don't dwell on it. What's done is done. And law be forgotten in a few days. 5. I just had the plaster taken off my leg, and now I've broken one of my fingers. Oh, keep your chin up. Someday you'll look back on all this and laugh. 6. We'll have to be more careful. We spent most of that lottery money already. Ah, well, easy come, easy go. It was good while it lasted. 7. I'm so disappointed I didn't get the contract for that stadium. They've given it to another firm of architects. Oh, you can't win them all. And you could always get a job with the other firm. If you can't beat them, join them. 8. It was horrific going out of the European Cup on a goal scored in the last few seconds. Yeah, it's not all doom and gloom, though. There's still the league title. Perhaps it's for the best. If they focus on that now, it might turn out to be a blessing in disguise. Tape script 7.13 Dear Tom, I won't ask how you are. I remember all too well. I know life's no picnic right now, and all in all, you haven't exactly had an easy start in life. My main advice is to stop wishing it had all been different. If it had, then you'd be different too. And, hard as it is to believe, you're actually just fine as you are. In fact, it's the difficult experiences you've had that will give you the strength and insight to make the most of the wonderful opportunities that are coming your way. Not that it's all a bed of roses from here on. There'll be no end of disappointments, but oh, if only you could realise that they're not as devastating as they seem. You get so upset when things don't go the way you think they need to. But hey, what gave you the idea that you know the best script for your life story? I've never worked out who or what writes the script, or indeed if there really is one. But looking back, it does all seem to work out pretty neatly. For example, I know it's a stretch to believe this right now, but you will get over Sarah dumping you. I know you think she's your one and only, and yes, she is lovely and drop-dead gorgeous, and the heartache won't let up for quite some time. But boy, wait till you see who comes along later. I won't spoil it for you, but I promise you'll find it was well worth the angst-filled wait. One tip. Shave off that ridiculous tash now. She'll admit later that it nearly put her off you. You'll make a few false starts with career choices, but I'm not going to help you avoid them. 
If you did, you might not appreciate just how lucky you are to have the job you'll wind up doing. Well, OK, maybe you could quit the job packing frozen chickens a bit sooner. It'll all get better once you stop agonising over what everyone thinks of you. Look, your real friends will always think generously of you. As for the others, truth be told, most of them are too busy fretting about themselves to give you much thought. It's how you feel about yourself that counts. And, well, I am you. And I certainly feel a lot of affection for you as I write this. Lots and lots of love. Tom. P.S. Find out what 10 to the power of 100 is called, and when a company with a name that sounds like that appears, buy a few shares in it. Unit 8. Gender Matters? Tapescript 8.1. Are you a typical male or female? Let's see. Uh, number one. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, definitely female. That's so totally me. I have loads of fabulous girlfriends, friends I've had since school. But I do too. All my school and uni male friends go back years. Yeah, but you can't call you and your mates typical, can you? All that male bonding is kind of rare, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> what about number two? Oh, now, that is absolutely a male thing. You're the original gadget man. <laughs> hey, not just gadgets. I like people just as much as things. Uh, I still think gadgets win for you. And uh, the next two, uh, names and birthdays. Hmm. <laughs> We're both absolutely typical for our sex with those. I'm always the one who remembers birthdays, and you... OK, I know. I have a real problem with names and birthdays. <laughs> what about five? Hmm. Uh, everyone I know just texts these days. Yeah. I don't think that's a male-female thing. Everyone texts all the time. But I do chat on the phone more than you. There's nothing like a really good chat. If you say so. What's next? Number six. Ah, yes. I'm definitely good with numbers. I never have a problem working out percentages. <sighs> me neither. I'm the one who studied maths, remember? <laughs> you never let me forget. Hmm. And, uh, seven and eight. Oh, <laughs> spot on. <laughs> Everyone knows that women are much better at multitasking. OK, and... I'll give you that. And I know, I know, very typically, I do talk about sport rather a lot. Rather a lot? Oh, you and your mates never stop. You go on and on. OK, and... OK, so we like our sport. Let's look at number nine. Uh, now, come on, you've got to admit you are a lousy navigator. That is surely typical for many females. Uh, I'm not that bad. Anyway, who needs maps? Everyone has sat-nav these days. And moving on, number ten. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'm sympathetic to others and their feelings, so ten is spot on. Oh, that's not fair. I'm a sympathetic kind of guy. I understand people's feelings. <sighs> OK, OK, you're a nice guy. <laughs> oh, but look at eleven. You do prefer to work alone and not in a team. Hmm. But then, I do too, actually. I'm not happy in a team, and if I am in a team, I like to lead. Now, uh, on to 12. Oh, I definitely don't do this. I like to talk about stuff that's worrying me, especially with my sister. You know what they say, a problem shared... Yeah, is a problem halved, I know that. I just don't go around spilling out all my troubles. A typical bloke, I suppose. Yeah, your mum complains to me that you keep too much to yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, what about 13? Hmm, now I'm definitely the linguist. You're not. <sighs> I know. I'd love to speak French like you do. 
Oh, <laughs> neither of us is typical for thirteen.、Mm, but we definitely are for the last one. I'll say. <laughs> I have no idea what you find interesting about great train journeys in Outer Mongolia. <laughs>、oh, come on, it wasn't Outer Mongolia. It was somewhere like that. Well, I don't know what you see in all those crime novels and chiclet. I do not read chiclet. They're well-written modern romances. <laughs> Anyway, let's add up. How typical are we? Tape script eight point two. A. It was the passengers who exhibited prejudice.、Mm, I can believe that. B. According to Eva and her sister, who is also a pilot, reactions are more likely to come from passengers. Two sisters who are pilots. That's got to be unusual. C. It's a cultural problem which needs to be tackled at an early age. What is? The lack of female pilots. That's true of many jobs. D. Their two-bedroom flat, which has no garden, felt terribly poky. I bet it did, especially with twins. E. The mum who he was talking to invited him to the pub. Did she? What would his wife say? F. Officials hurried him through what's normally a long and tedious procedure. Which procedure is that? Oh, all the stuff you have to do and forms you have to fill in when you're looking for a job. Tape script eight point three. One. I don't like children who always interrupt their parents' conversations and whose parents never tell them to be more polite. Two. The journey from work to home, which is always a nightmare, took over three hours yesterday. I'm going to have to change job or move house. Three. Politicians who make impossible promises just to get elected. Aren't worth listening to. Four. The Taj Mahal, which took twenty-two years to complete, is built from exquisitely carved white marble. Five. These are the photographs my grandma gave me when she was a young girl with her grandma. So that's my great great grandma. <laughs> Apparently, she was called Rosemary. Six. We docked at the small port on the coast of East Africa, where my parents lived twenty-five years ago, and where both my brother and I were born. Seven. My cousin, who's afraid of heights, went paragliding at the weekend. I thought he was mad, but he said it was fine—not the same as being on a cliff or at the top of a tall building. Eight. We went on a cycling holiday in Wales, which I really wasn't keen to do, but in fact I had a great time despite the rain. Tape script eight point four. One. Flights booked one month in advance have a ten percent discount. Booking your flight in advance gives you a better deal. Two. The new uniforms worn by the pilots looked very smart. Visitors wearing sleeveless tops will be denied entry. Three. We took a shortcut, saving an hour on our journey time. With the money saved from giving up smoking, I'm buying a bike. Four. Taking all things into account, I've decided to resign. Taken three times a day, these tablets will help your allergy. Five. I fell on the ice, injuring my wrist. The boy injured in the car accident is in hospital. Six. Breaking promises leads to lack of trust. Broken promises lead to lack of trust. Seven. Giving away secrets won't win you any friends. Given the chance, I'd love to work in New York.
Eight. Growing up in the countryside is healthy for young kids. Strawberries grown under polythene ripen more quickly. Tape script eight point five. Bringing up Max. Have you seen this? Poor we might. Hmm. What? Who's a poor we might? This poor kid. He's just a toddler, one year old. How can they do this to him? For goodness' sake, who are they, and what on earth have they done? Just look at these pictures. Uh, yeah. So, what are you bothered about? He looks really cute, don't you think? Like his checked lumberjack shirt, <coughs> and he's got his big sister's pink tutu on. Bless him. <laughs> I remember when our Sam wanted a bow in his hair like Emma, and he loved wearing all those frocks she had for dressing up, especially the Cinderella one. Remember, we thought it was funny, but Emma poured scorn on him. Oh yeah, that's what big sisters do. But this is different. Max, he's called Max. He hasn't got a sister. And it seems the pink tutu was bought specially for him.、Mm. It says here that wearing frocks is all part of his parents' plan. To bring him up to be gender neutral. Gender neutral. He's a little boy. I don't get it. Whatever does it mean?、Well, it's supposed to be a radical new technique for child rearing, where boys and girls are treated exactly the same.、Mm. His mother, she's called Lisa, says, quote, "We're doing it because gender stereotyping can be so damaging. It teaches little boys to be aggressive."、Oh. Well, all I can say is that I'm glad we didn't know that when we were bringing up our Sam. Gender stereotyping, eh? Well, I suppose there could just be a point to that. So, you think our son is aggressive? No, of course not. Didn't say that. Sam's a smashing kid. He's full of life. He's your typical happy, energetic, bolshy teenager. It's just that. It's just what? I mean, it's a ludicrous idea. Max's parents are actively encouraging him to be more girl-like, and they're not just keen for him to wear girls' clothes, but they also want him to play with conventionally female toys as well as boys' toys. I mean, they're delighted if he wants to wear a pink tutu and fairy wings, and if he decides not to play football and wants to paint his fingernails with glittery polish, they will view it as a form of cute self-expression. It says here. Why are they doing all this? They believe it will help boost his confidence. But how on earth is wearing a tutu a boost to a boy's confidence? <laughs> But look, you know as well as I do, all toddlers will have a go at anything that takes their fancy. Doesn't matter if it's for boys or girls; they don't care. They're just too young to bow to peer pressure. Exactly that. You don't have to actively encourage toddlers one way or the other. They just do their own toddler thing. <sighs> Let's see this article here. Oh, I remember that as well, don't you? You know that Canadian couple a while back. They made the headlines when they refused to reveal the sex of their newborn baby. They called it Storm, and dressed it neutrally so that no one would stereotype it. Oh, that's awful. I don't mean calling the baby Storm, but calling him or her it all the time. It's, it's not just awful. It's weird. They said that what they were doing was. Quote a tribute to freedom and choice.、Mm, whose choice? Their choice, not the baby's.、Oh, it's the same for this boy Max. It's not his choice. And what about when he goes to school? I mean, what will? Oh, hey, hey, look, look here. Yes, just as I thought. Max's parents say that they're planning on home educating Max so that he won't have to wear gender-specific clothes when he starts school. No,、oh, no surprise there. Don't you think he's in danger of growing up to be a rather lonely, confused little boy?、Uh, that remains to be seen. How long can his parents keep this up, though? And those Canadian parents? I can't believe they can carry on calling their child it forever. I'd like to see into the future. What will these kids be like in ten years' time? Yeah, and what will their parents be doing? It's as if they're using their kids as guinea pigs. I don't think it's fair on the kids. Hi, Mum. Hi, Dad. We won again, and I'm starving. Ah, there's our flawless offspring. <laughs> to the kitchen, woman. Feed the boy. <laughs> <laughs> huh? What's up with you two?
Tape Script 8.6. Dr. Eugene Berrison. To raise a child not as a boy or a girl is creating, in some sense, a freak. The Canadian couple's approach is a terrible idea because identity formation is really critical for every human being, and part of that is gender. There are many cultural and social forces at play. Since the sexual revolution of the 1970s, child development experts have embraced a more flexible view of gender. Before that, the stereotypes of boys were that they were self-sufficient, non-empathetic, tough, and good at war. Girls were trained to be empathetic and caring and more nurturing. But since then, women have become more competitive, aggressive, and independent. And by the same token, men are allowed to cry. We often see hulking football players who are bawling. Tape script 8.7. 1. Did you hear that? Andy called me useless and inefficient. Don't worry. He's just as rude to me as you. Hmm. 2. A pair of red socks. That's just what I wanted. Oh, I'm so glad you like them. You can't go wrong with socks as a present. <laughs> but they're always useful. Yeah. 3. Can I have mine black with two sugars? Ah, oh, we're just about out of coffee. Uh, not to worry. Tea will do. Actually. 4. Where are you? I expected you hours ago. I'm just leaving now. I got held up with a conference call. See you soon. Five. I come in shattered from work and look at the mess. You haven't even washed up the breakfast things and... Just listen to me for once. It isn't my fault. The baby was sick just after you left and I had to ring the doctor. And then the... Six. Did you see that film, Fargo, on TV last night? Oh, I couldn't watch it after the first few minutes. I was just terrified. Seven. I've just heard the news. You got that job after all. I know. I'm thrilled. I didn't hear back for so long I thought they'd found someone else. Then suddenly I was called for a second interview. Eight. Hi. Great to see you. Oh, where's Tom? Uh, Tom couldn't come, so it's just me. Oh dear, you two haven't fallen out again, have you? Tape Script 8.8 .8. .8. 1 We're sitting at the back in row 102. We've had another row about our finances. 2 that was never him singing live. He was miming. Live and let live is my philosophy. Three. Close that window. There's one hell of a draft. You're not close to getting the answer. Four. I soon got used to working the late night shift. I don't trust used car dealers. I'd never buy a car from one. Five. It's impossible to tear open this packet. Give me a knife. A single tear ran silently down her cheek as she waved goodbye. Six. He always looks so content with his lot. The content of your essay was excellent, but there were rather a lot of spelling mistakes. Seven. The head teacher complained to the parents about their son's conduct in class. Simon Rattle is going to conduct the BBC Symphony Orchestra this evening. 8. Could you record the next episode for me? I'm out that night. He's broken the Olympic world record for the 100 metres. Tape script 8.9. Mom, Tommy's fighting with Ryan again. Oh dear, but I suppose boys will be boys. Bye.
Hey, Gran. Jamie and I are off out for the evening. Have a great time. They don't do anything I wouldn't do. I'm thinking of having another tattoo. A scorpion, maybe. Just above where it says I love Mum. What do you think? Uh, it's not for me to say. At the end of the day, it's your decision. You all have to live with it. Tape script 8.10. One. I just came across my very first girlfriend on Facebook. Oh, I bet that was a blast from the past. Are you going to friend her? Um, I'm not sure. Looks like she's changed quite a lot. Two. Larry's failed his exams. Amy's got the chicken pox. Whatever next. Oh dear, watch out. They say these things come in threes. I don't want to know that. Three. Dad, I've been picked for the school football team. First eleven. That's my boy. Like father, like son. <laughs> what do you mean? You only ever made the second eleven. Four. If I offer to pay, she'll say I'm old-fashioned. If I don't, she'll say I'm mean. <laughs> Poor you. You'll be damned if you do and damned if you don't. Yeah, it's a tricky situation. Five. I got a card from Jerry one week after my birthday. Oh, wow. Better late than never. <sighs> you think so? I'm afraid it's the final straw. Six. We're having a complete break, a fortnight in the Caribbean, St Lucia. Sounds like just what the doctor ordered. In fact, the doctor did. He said Bill would have a breakdown if we didn't take some time off. Seven. It took me ten years to build up my business. It nearly killed me. Well, you know what they say. No pain, no gain. Yes. But nothing is worth ruining your health for. Eight. I just need to go back in the house and make sure I've turned off the oven. Good idea. Better safe than sorry. Yeah, otherwise I'd be worrying all the way through the film. Nine. They've got ten kids. Goodness knows what their house is like. Oh, the mind boggles. It doesn't bear thinking about. Yeah, I've only got two and it's chaos most of the time. Ten. Bob's a weird bloke. He's going to live alone on a remote Scottish island for a year. It takes all sorts. <laughs> you can say that again. Tape script 8.11 A Tale from the Brothers Grimm The Princess and the Frog one warm summer's evening, a beautiful young princess, feeling bored and lonely in the grand rooms of the palace, decided to take a walk in the nearby wood. With her, she took her favourite plaything, a golden ball, which she loved to toss up in the air and catch. After a while, she happened upon a shady pool of spring water. So she sat herself down to enjoy the cool and started idly throwing her golden ball high in the air, watching it glint in the evening sunlight. She reached out to catch it, but, dazzled by the brightness of the sun, she missed it and it splashed down into the centre of the pond. Distraught, the princess leapt to her feet and, looking down into the black depths of the water, she began to weep. Alas, she lamented, if I could only get my ball again, I'd give all my fine clothes and jewels and everything that I have in the world. No sooner had she finished speaking when a frog's head popped up out of the water and he inquired, Princess, why are you weeping so bitterly? Ugh, she thought, a disgusting slimy frog. But she sniffed and cried, <laughs> My golden ball is lost forever in the deep, dark water. The frog said, 
I don't want any of your finery. But if you will love me and let me live with you and eat from your golden plate and sleep on your bed, I will retrieve your ball. What ridiculous nonsense this silly frog is talking, thought the princess. He'll never be able to leave the pond to visit me. However, he may be able to get my ball. So she said to the frog, If you bring me my ball, I'll do all you ask. The frog dived deep into the water, and after a little while he emerged carrying the ball in his mouth and threw it onto the edge of the pond. The princess was overjoyed. She ran to pick up the ball, and without any sign of gratitude or a backward glance at the frog, ran home as fast as she could. The frog called vainly after her. Stay, princess! What about your promise? But she ignored his plea. However, next day, just as the princess was sitting down to dinner, there was a strange noise outside. Something was coming up the marble staircase. Then came a gentle knock at the door, and a croaky voice cried out, Open the door, my princess dear. Open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. The princess ran to the door and opened it, and there stood the frog. She had forgotten all about him, and now the sight of him frightened her. She slammed the door in his face and hurried back to her seat. The king, alarmed at his daughter's distress, asked her what was the matter. There is a disgusting, slimy frog at the door, she said. He helped me get my ball back when it fell into the pond, and I promised he could live with me here, but, but, but... The frog knocked again and called out again. Open the door, my princess dear. Open the door to thy true love here. And mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. The king was an honourable man, and he admonished his daughter. If you have given your word, even to a frog, you must keep it. You must invite the frog in. Very reluctantly she obeyed her father, and the frog hopped into the room next to the table where the princess sat. Lift me onto the chair and let me sit next to you, he commanded the princess. As soon as she had done this, the frog said, Put your plate next to me so I may eat out of it. This she did, and when he had eaten as much as he could, he said, Now I'm weary. Take me upstairs and put me onto your bed. And most unwillingly, the princess picked him up and carried him up to her room. She laid him on her pillow, where he slept soundly all night long. Then, as dawn broke, he jumped up, hopped down the stairs and out of the house. The princess sighed with relief. Ah, oh, at last he's gone. I'll be troubled no more. But she was mistaken. For when night came again, she heard the same tapping at the door, and she heard the familiar croaky voice. Open the door, my princess dear. Open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. The princess opened the door and the frog came in, slept on her pillow as before till the morning broke. This pattern continued for three nights, and the lonely princess became used to his company and spoke more kindly to him. On the third morning, the frog thanked her for her friendship and announced that he would be leaving her for good. He asked if she would kiss him goodbye. Still a little reluctant, she closed her eyes tightly and bent to kiss his slimy lips. To her absolute amazement, when she opened her eyes again, she found herself gazing into the loving eyes of the most handsome prince. 
He told her his sad tale. A wicked fairy had turned him into a frog and cast him into the pond. Only the kindness of a princess for three days and nights could save him. You, said the prince, have broken the fairy's cruel spell, and now I have nothing to wish for but that you should go with me to my father's kingdom where we will marry and love each other as long as we both live. The young princess was overjoyed. Hand in hand they went together to see her father, who rejoiced at his daughter's happiness. She took her leave of him sadly, but full of excitement, and set out for the prince's kingdom, where they married and lived happily ever after. Unit 10 Body and Mind Tape script 10.1 How well do you know your body? 1. Every day the average person loses between 50 and 100 hairs, but you would have to lose over 50% of the hairs on your head before anyone would notice. Blondes have more hair, about 140,000 hairs on their head. Brunettes average about 110,000. People with black hair, about 108,000, and redheads come in last with about 80,000 average hairs on their head. 2. The average adult heart is about the size of two fists. The main artery from the heart, the aorta, is about the diameter of a garden hose. The human heart creates enough pressure to squirt blood up to a distance of 30 feet. 3. Nerve impulses to and from the brain travel as fast as 250 miles per hour. The fastest messages are to the brain's pain receptors, telling you that that metal is hot. It's a common myth that we use only a small part of our brain. It may be as little as 10% when resting, but during the course of a typical day, we use 100% of our brain. 4. Babies are born with 50% more bones than adults have. Many of these bones then fuse together, making larger bone structures that would have made it impossible for the baby to be born. As adults, we are about one centimetre taller in the morning than in the evening, when our joints have settled and become thinner. 5. Fingernails grow roughly twice as fast as toenails, and both now grow 25% more than they did 70 years ago as a result of our protein-rich diet. The fastest growing nail is on the middle finger. The longer the finger, the faster the nail grows. 6. Most people blink around 15 times a minute, but that reduces by a half when staring at a computer screen, which is why long-term computer users often suffer from dry eye syndrome. It increases when lying. Babies blink only twice a minute. 7. Children have three times as many taste buds as adults, which is why they often find bitter vegetables inedible and why older people enjoy them more. The number of taste buds varies widely between people, with some people having four or five times as many as others. By the age of 60, most people will have lost about a half of their taste buds. 8. According to a study by the Mayo Clinic in the US, the three most common reasons for visits to the doctor are skin complaints, joint problems, for example arthritis, and back problems. Another common complaint is referred to by doctors as TAT, T-A-T-T, -T, tired all the time. Tape script 10.2 1. A leading private surgeon is reported to be under investigation for fraud. 2. Dr Martin Crispin is believed to own three private clinics in London. 3. Dr Crispin and his colleagues are said to charge up to £1,000 for a consultation. 4. 
Dr. Crispin was supposed to have qualified in South Africa. 5. He is now known never to have trained as a surgeon. 6. His medical certificates are now assumed to be fakes. 7. He was considered to be a specialist in cosmetic surgery. 8. Dr. Crispin is understood to have been sued recently by five different patients. 9. Two of his colleagues are alleged to have performed surgery while drunk. 10. The doctor and his wife are presumed to have gone into hiding this morning. Tapescript 10.3 Down to Earth with a Bump Part 1 So you took off okay. What went wrong? Yeah, I took off fine, and I was doing um, very well in the race. I was going along um, with a bunch of others, and it was getting progressively windier. We were jumping from mountain range to mountain range, and um, I split up with uh, the people I was flying with, and I got stuck in a little windy valley and I got lower and lower and really uh, where the wind mixes with the mountainscape you get a lot of turbulence and I was just at the wrong height uh, we carry a reserve with us and normally you can throw your reserve if you if it if it the wind collapses um, so that would be a parachute effectively uh, a parachute yeah and uh, you can come down under that uh, or normally the wing will reopen itself anyway, but I was at the height where the reserve wouldn't open and it was still high enough to, to hurt when I hit the ground. So, so, so how far did you fall, do you think? Probably about 60 feet, I think. Oh, my but, goodness. Um, and, and what was the impact like? What do you remember um, of it? I, I remember bouncing <laughs> quite a lot, and I rolled over a few times then came to came to rest underneath a few bushes. And uh, But generally, I was pretty well bashed up. I broken all the ribs on my left uh, my pelvis in about five places and my left arm completely snapped off my the humerus the ball joint on the on my, oh my goodness you must have been in terrible pain weren't you so i was in a lot of pain and i was a bit um shocked really uh my, you were wearing sunglasses weren't you as well at the yeah time? my sunglasses my nice new sunglasses dug into my nose and so my face was bleeding quite a lot and so, yeah, generally bashed up. So when you kind of came to a standstill, what was going through your mind? Um, well, I just uh, looked around and checked that I was still alive. I checked my, my, all my limbs and thought, well, basically I'm, I'm bashed, but I'm not, uh, you know, I'm still here. Uh, I had a strange thing where my eyesight started to degrade. Uh, I'd been looking around the clouds and the mountains just to see if anybody had seen me crash and there was nobody. And then... After a while, all I could see was maybe 100 yards into the grass, and then that came right down to just the twigs around me. And why was that happening? And it was a uh, shock. And I had this weird voice saying, oh, guy, this is a classic sign of shock. You need oxygen now. Uh, and I said out loud, oh, that's lucky. I've got some oxygen with me. So I reached into my pack. We fly very, very high in Idaho, so you do need oxygen from time to time. Reached into my pack, found my oxygen tube, turned it on full blast and snorted some of that. And uh, ten minutes later, I was up to, it was like a computer rebooting and all my vision came back. And How so did that, you know that? I, I didn't know. I just I must have gone some, in some some, at some point. Yeah, yeah, And I'd remembered it. That's but, tremendous. Um, That's it was that, very, quite very amazing. Mm -hmm. And was, did you have any way of calling for help? Did you have a radio? Did you have a mobile no, telephone? I punctured a lung as well. So I did yell help, but it didn't come out very loud. <laughs> Tape script 10.4, part two. Uh, I had uh, a mobile phone, that, but there was no signal. I had a, a radio, but the, uh, that obviously malfunctioned when I hit the ground. And um, I had no... What I need, did need was a, a satellite tracker. Um, we, the organisers of the competition had given us trackers, but that did, they worked off the mobile phone signal, and, and that didn't work either. So I was completely stuck. In You're the, completely isolated in the middle of, yeah, nowhere, middle of nowhere, no means of communication. Did you yeah. panic? Um, no, I just lay there. I got made myself as comfortable as I could in my harness and thought, well, if I get rescued uh, before before dark I, I'm, I might get away with uh, my wife and kids not not finding out about, about how, what but, predicament I was in but you didn't but, get uh, rescued before dark did you you had to spend the night there what no. was that night like well that was that was as it 
I was sort of quite comfortable. It was the first and, night, in fact, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the first night. Uh, yeah. So I crashed at about three o'clock in the afternoon, and the first night it was fine. I was reasonably comfortable, and I just thought I was starting to nod off to have a have a snooze, and um, then I heard this awful growling noise. <laughs> Right. <laughs> what did you think that was? Uh, I didn't know what it was. I looked up behind me. I sort of, I could just crane my neck round and uh, saw up, up on the side of the hill a uh, huge, great big bear. Ah. So um, I that really concentrated the mind for a while. So I tried to make where I was look to the bear like it was a little hunting camp. So I took pictures with my mobile, the flash on my mobile phone. What, and trying I, to frighten it with the light? Yeah, and I sang, uh, she'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. So because you thought the noise would frighten the bear off? Yeah, well, I just uh, hoped that they would think it, that there were maybe more more than one person there. And but, is that uh, what happened? Did the bear well, go away and leave it you? it didn't like, the, also my canopy was fluffing around in the wind, so it didn't like that either, so it didn't come any closer. I heard it later in the night, crashing about in the trees below me, but... Uh, but you didn't luckily, get much sleep. No, I was sort of a bit fitful. Tape script 10.5, part three. Then the next day you decided to get moving, didn't you? Yeah, I, I decided that you, can, you can't last that long without water. I had a few litres of water and it looked like there was a nice river at the bottom of the valley. So uh, I thought at least if I could get next to the, the water, I'd be fine. And uh, How did you move though? You'd broken your pelvis. Well, I'd, yeah, I pushed with my good arm and pulled with my legs and I managed to make my way through the grass and it was quite painful. But uh, oh, Quite painful? Um, I was setting my teeth on edge just thinking yeah, about that. But I got, I got all the way down to the bottom of the valley and uh, it was completely dry. So I knew, knew I had to start walking somehow. So I, I reached out a hand and there was this amazing stick. Um, so it took me a couple of hours, very painful hours to get to my feet. Um, Two hours to get to your feet. Yeah. Um, but this, with this stick, armed with the stick, I was able to make very slow progress. I'd move the stick, swing one leg, swing the other one, and, and on I go. And so I, I made about a mile that, that day. And... Um, in the evening, it, the 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 weather started to break down, and it's a very desert area. I mean, it hardly ever rains there. But that evening, there was a huge, huge thunderstorm. So I just lay on the ground and got completely drenched um, with this thunder and lightning going on all night. And, what, what, um, what was the first clue that you might be going to be rescued? Um, the first clue was the next day I heard a helicopter uh, coming into my valley, um, at about three in the afternoon, and um, I, it came into my valley and then flew straight out the other side. So I just thought, well, they'd missed me, and that, that's that's the end of that. But in fact, um, there was a friend of mine, Russell Ogden, a very old paragliding. He's a bit of a legend in the paragliding world, and he had seen me out of the corner of his eye. He's got terrible eyesight, but he's still seen me. And he yelled at the helicopter pilot to go around. They went round and landed. And I didn't, I didn't hear that because there was a bend in the valley. And um, they'd landed, seen my canopy and landed by it. Russ jumped out of the helicopter, nearly broke an ankle, and um, then raced down. They saw my track and raced down the valley, find, trying to find me. And, and, about, and what did you find out later about the nature of the search operation that had been launched? Because I mentioned was, earlier, there was it was quite an there extensive was a operation. Huge operation going on. I had no idea, but there were probably a hundred people up in the mountains, all out on mo mountain bikes, and um, uh, there were light planes up. There were just people on their days off who who'd heard about it and were out looking. And it was. Um, when eventually I got found, the helicopter eventually came down the valley and did find me. And, and when it went out on the radio, there were hoops of uh, of joy amongst the uh, the people looking. So it was a great oh, goodness. Big and, and what about your family? You said you'd hoped that they might not find out. Presumably they'd have been told they and they'd had be very a worried. Horrible twenty four hours at home, um, all waiting. But they were they were very stoic and quite brilliant. Uh, and uh, we're a very close family, and it was it was very difficult for them, I know. And I gather that after the rescue, you updated your Facebook profile with the words, Guy Anderson is world champion hide-and-seek winner. <laughs> yes. Which shows a certain a few, sense of humour. <laughs> <laughs> a few people thought I actually was. The... <laughs> How long did it take you to recover from your injuries? Uh, it, I'd, where I'd crashed, I'd actually just got enough points to get me into the big race of the year, which is the World Cup Super Final. 
So I had between August when I crashed and January when the super final was to get better enough to compete in the in the big race of the year. So I yeah, just 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 under six months. And you had no doubt at all about going back. I had l- plenty of doubts, and uh, and I, I it's really. Uh, the worst thing is for my family. I, I know that I put them through hell, but it's a, a horrible addiction that I have to flying. But it does put you in places that um, you can only dream of, and um, I can't stop it. Guy, it's an amazing story. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Tape script 10.6 A. It was quite brilliant. B. It was quite good. C. It was quite good. Tape script 10.7. 1. That lesson wasn't as dull as I expected. Yes, it was quite interesting. 2. Emma's not an easy child to deal with, is she? Oh, she can be quite impossible sometimes. Three. I noticed that Bob wasn't exactly thrilled with his birthday present. He seemed quite pleased. Four. They charge £1.30 for a small bottle of water. Don't you think that's silly? It's quite ridiculous. Five. It's a lovely day for February, isn't it? Yes, it's quite warm. Six. So I hear the exam wasn't as much of a challenge as you expected. Well, it was quite difficult. 7. So, you decided to rent the room. You didn't find it too small. No, I thought it was quite big. 8. It's not like any other cafe, this one, is it? No, it really is quite unique. Tape script. 10.8 10.8 1 Come on, don't let it all get you down. Keep your chin up. 2 I tried to persuade Pete, but he dug his heels in and refused to change his mind. 3 I find it hard to stomach when politicians half my age start preaching to me. 4 It varies, but as a rule of thumb, I'd allow 20 minutes a mile on this walk. 5. The teachers in my school were pretty strict. They made us toe the line. 6. How dare he expect me to tidy up after him? What a cheek! 7. I'm ashamed about it all, but I'm glad I've told you. I needed to get it off my chest. 8. The boys stood on one side of the room, eyeing up the girls on the other side. 9. The government talks as if they're concerned about the environment, but they're just paying lip service. 10. These candlesticks aren't easy to clean. You'll need a bit of elbow grease. Tape script 10.9 1. Oh, lovely cat. 2. Oh, how lovely to see you again. 3. Psst, look over in the corner at what that man's wearing. Four. Sorry, I I really couldn't eat that. 
five. <sighs> These tablets are huge. Six. Yes, yes, definitely. Seven. How dare you! Eight. Mmm, it's cinnamon, I think. <laughs> or maybe cloves. Nine. Move over! <laughs> Ten. Oh, terrific! Well played! Eleven. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> oh, give up! <laughs> Twelve. Could you step this way, sir? And hold out your arms? Tape script 10.10. .10. But you didn't get rescued before dark, did you? You must have been in terrible pain, weren't you? You decided to get moving, didn't you? Tape script 10.11. One. You've made a mess of this, Prime Minister, haven't you? Two. So, you left your homework on the bus, did you? Three. Try some of my bread. That's a damn fine loaf, that is. Tape script 10.12. One. You will be careful, won't you? Of course I will. It's not a very difficult climb. It's only 3,000 metres. Two. So, you were out with Lisa last night, were you? What if I was? And I'm certainly not going to tell you what happened. Three. You meant to kill the victim, Mr Jones, didn't you? I absolutely did not. It was a horrible accident. Four. I've been a bit stupid, haven't I? You haven't. It's so easy to be taken in by internet scams. Five. You're lazy, you are. Am I? Says who? Mister, isn't it time for another coffee break? Six. So these are the spacious bedrooms, are they? Uh, indeed they are, though the other estate agent did describe them as compact. Seven. That can't be right, can it? Uh, it is. We did have starters, and we've had quite a lot to drink. Eight. I always do a good job, I do. Do you? Well, I think Mr Johnson will have the final say on that. Nine. Oh, yeah. Camping will really appeal to Joe, won't it? Well, it will have to. We can't afford to stay in a hotel this year. Ten. So that's all the help I'm getting, is it? It is, I'm afraid. I've painted three walls. I really have to pick up the kids from school now. Eleven. It won't hurt, will it? Not much. It's a very small needle. Twelve. I went and beat him, didn't I? Did you? Wow! Well done! Those tennis lessons were obviously worth it. Thirteen. Mmm, that's a proper cup of coffee, that is. It sure is. I grind the beans myself. Fourteen. Let's eat, shall we? Yes, I'm starving. Tape script 10.13. One. Hmm. You haven't seen my car keys, have you? No, you had them this morning. That doesn't mean I know where they are now, though, does it? 
Well, let's look in the places you usually leave them, shall we? I've already done that. And here they are. Now that wasn't hard, was it? Oh, thanks. You're a star, you are. Two. You've forgotten the shopping list, haven't you? Yes, I have. But I gave it to you as we were leaving, didn't I? Yeah, but I've left it on the kitchen table. Ah, oh, you're so forgetful, you are. Oh, and you're perfect, are you? Unit Eleven, our high-tech world. Tape script eleven point one. Me and my tech. I'm totally at sea without my phones. I have two、um, for personal stuff and work. And these days, I use my tablet and Apple iPad for writing stuff more than I use my computer. I think it's easier. I'm a bit of an Apple fanboy. <laughs> I have the iPad, the iPhone, and the iMac, and I have literally hundreds of apps, lots of weather apps and games.、Um, my favourite game is Defender. It's because it's the game I played as a child when computer games first came out. <laughs> my wife says I'm the original gadget man. You name it, and I have it. <laughs> I like Playstations for games. Fitness gadgets like withings and wireless weighing scales. I kind of started to take my health seriously. <laughs> Must be an age thing. <laughs> oh, and music gadgets like Sonos. I have a Sonos system at home. Yeah, and pff, I stream music everywhere, downstairs and in our bedroom. I use Spotify and internet radio for this, but I still have a normal radio in my car and a sat nav, of course. I have two, one in my car and one on my phone. It's much better because it gives traffic info as well. I haven't used a map for ages. I suppose, in some ways, I'm a techno geek, but I'm not a great social networker. Although I have used LinkedIn for work and jobs. Um, <laughs> one thing I could do without is so many emails. I get thousands a week, mainly work. But it really bugs me the way colleagues in the same office email you rather than pick up the phone or walk over and have a proper conversation. It's weird. Technology both connects you and isolates you at the same time. You can connect with friends and family all over the world. You can Facebook or Skype them, and that's great. But then you see couples in restaurants, both on their phones, and not communicating with each other. My wife and I make a point of conversing fiercely across the table when we're out together, <laughs> more than we do at home. <laughs> There's so much tech around already; it's difficult to keep pace with it all. So I have no idea what the future holds. Time travel would be brilliant. I'd like to go backwards, not forwards. Maybe to just after the war in London. That would be interesting. Or better still, back to a really great Wimbledon tennis final. I'm not sure about 3D printers.、Uh, well, my son, he's eight, says he'd use one to make all the Lego bits he's lost. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea to me. I suppose the future is this Internet of Things thing, you know, where you can run your whole house via the internet, sit at work, and turn the oven on. Or mow the lawn with a robot lawnmower, but heck, it all becomes so unfit, so unhealthy. Mind you, I suppose I'll still have my fitness app. Actually, I've changed my mind. I'd like to time travel a hundred years into the future just to see what happens technology-wise. What on earth will the world be like? Tape script eleven point two. The Internet of Things. This is you and yours, Radio Four's consumer program. If you've got a smartphone and a laptop, they'll be connected to the internet when they're switched on, and it's predicted that by 2020, lots and lots of other things we use will also be connected. Things as varied as rubbish bins, car parks, roads, and fridges. It's being called 
the Internet of Things. And Ofcom, the communications regulator, is predicting that up to 50 billion things will be linked to the web by the end of this decade. Lots of people have stuff that's linked already. Here's Christian Payne. He's a technology blogger. It's early days for the Internet of Things, and yet there are so many things talking on the Internet right now. More things than people, in fact stood at the side of a busy road in London and it wouldn't surprise me at all to find out that many of these cars and vehicles are at this moment connected to the internet whether it be through their tracking devices or their navigation apps which are logging and reporting and recording data not just for the user in the vehicle but also other people wanting to know about traffic conditions and journey times ahead. I personally use an app that does this, an app which has been in the news a lot recently called Waze. I find it vital for me to get to where I want to go faster and quicker. It also notifies me in real time uh, should there be speed traps, but obviously I, I drive within the parameters of the law. I can also see other drivers using the same app and it's kind of comforting to know that there are people as geeky as me, <laughs> logging data as they drive. Around my neck at the moment, I have an autographer, an automatic camera, which for bloggers, it's a normal device. It enables you to, to document your day in images which can connect to your mobile phone and be shared very easily to social spaces where you can keep a record of events that you want to remember personally, but you can also share that with anybody with an internet connection standing in Regent's Park and just in the last minute I've seen 15 or so runners passing me by all wearing the same kind of technology I have around my neck a fitness computer some of them are just using their mobile devices some of them have wristbands but what these little computers are doing are logging speed location in some instances how many calories they're burning how active they are and this will stream to the internet perhaps through their mobile device and enable them to compete with their friends. If I'm sat too long at my desk, at, in my office, I, I can get a notification from a friend telling me maybe I should get up and have a walk. I really like this, this peer pressure forcing me to, to be more active. This is just the beginning of, of connecting our bodies to the internet in this way. Health is going to it's going to be revolutionized by where we choose to place this data whether it be with our local doctors or organizations who are researching anything to do with the body christian payne and we wondered if this technology is just for serious enthusiasts like him or for everyone and we decided to ask william webb he's deputy president of the institute of engineering and technology William, this talk of 50 billion devices by the end of the decade suggests some kind of revolution's about to happen to us. Do you think it is? I, I think it is, but it's more going to happen to machines than to us. Uh, now, of course, we interact with machines a lot. So what we'll notice is lots of things just working better. Uh, our car will take us better to the place we want to get to. Our washing machine will work better. But I don't think it will impact us as obviously and as immediately as something like the iPhone and the change to smartphones did. And indeed, the whole idea of this really is to work in the background to make our world a better, easier place to live in, rather than to be in our face the whole time. We had some practical examples there from Christian Payne, mm. but tell us what would be the benefit of a fridge communicating with the net? Oh, the fridge has been a, an example that's been quoted for so long, it's uh, almost become a joke, hasn't it? Um, there are a lot of reasons why we might want to start connecting many of our white goods in our home most of those actually revolve around either maintenance or energy usage so for example uh, the fridge could could know that its compressor was starting to labor harder and as a result it was probably going to break at some time in the next few months in fact it's quite easy to spot uh, imminent breakdown of those kind of components and it could send a message out to the manufacturer or to the retailer warning them that this was happening and you could have someone effectively ring you up and say I need to come and maintain your fridge before it actually failed and you lost all the goods that were in the fridge. This may be a naive question, but mm. won't these gadgets crowd out the space available, overload the system? Uh, they could overload our existing cellular 
phone systems, which is why a number of people, including myself, are looking at alternative wireless technologies that are optimised very specifically for these machines. Now, some people worry that all this reliance on technology, e even as we have it now, relying mm. on the sat-nav rather than a map, um, that we are making ourselves vulnerable to attack. Are they right? Well, we're certainly getting much more reliant on all sorts of technology. Now, of course, this is nothing new. We've become reliant on electricity over the last uh, century. Uh, we've become reliant on the internet over the last decade. And if either of those two systems went down, I think people's lives would be dramatically altered. And I think what tends to happen is at first people don't rely too much on these new things. So when you first got your sat-nav, you probably also kept the map in the car just in case the sat-nav didn't work. And then progressively over time, you become uh, more reliant on it as you see that it is more reliable. Um, but we do need to make sure absolutely that we are safe against all kinds of potential failure, either from terrorists or in failure uh, that might be caused by software errors or, or lack of electricity or similar kinds of things. William Webb, we must leave it there. William Webb, Deputy President of the Institute of Engineering. Tape script 11.3. When might billions of things be connected to the Internet? What kind of things? Who are Christian Payne and William Webb? What does Christian find comforting? Where does he wear his autographer? What does he wear it for? How many runners did he see? How does William Webb think white goods will mainly interact with the Internet? Which thing is quoted so often that it's become a joke? Why is he looking at alternative wireless technologies? Tape script 11.4 one. Thanks for the great feedback on my report. I was impressed. You really know your stuff. Do you think so? Oh, yes. You're destined for great things at this firm. Two. What sort of stuff do you get with your new car? Oh, all the usual stuff. Sat-nav, DAB radio, leather seats. Doesn't sound like the usual stuff to me. You should see my old banger. Three. How do you cope with all that pressure at work and four kids? You know me. I'm made of strong stuff. And you never moan. Well, there's not much point. I just have to get on with it. Four. Are you ready to go? We're late. I'll just get my stuff and we can be off. OK. I'll be waiting in the car. Five. We were crossing a field and suddenly there was this huge bull heading towards us. That's the stuff of nightmares. I'd have been terrified. Believe me, we were. Six. What a day. I'm in pieces. I lost my car keys and had to walk home in the pouring rain and... Oh, come on, cheer up. Stuff happens. I'll make a cup of tea. Oh, I need something stronger than that. Seven. Ugh! What's that on the carpet? I'm not sure. It looks like a load of sticky brown stuff. Ugh, it's melted chocolate. One of the kids must have dropped it. Eight. I did it! I can't believe it! Three A's! Great stuff. All that hard work paid off. It did. I can really enjoy my holiday now. Tape script 11.5 1. You offer to pay for a round of drinks. 2. You think you have no chance of passing the exams. 3. Your theatre ticket says Hamlet, 7.30pm. 4. You've made an appointment to get your hair cut tomorrow. 5. You arrange to help your friend move flat 
but now you find you can't. 6. Next week, you will be on holiday. You can see yourself having a cocktail by the swimming pool. 7. You can see yourself at 40. You've started your own business and it's already successful. 8. You didn't get in touch with a friend because you had flu. Tape script 11.6 1. Hey guys, I'll get this round in. Thanks Kev, I'll have a pint of best. Mine's the same. 2. I really don't think I have a chance of passing the exams. I'm definitely going to fail. No, you won't. You say that every time and you do brilliantly. 3. Hurry up. The place starts in half an hour. I can't find my ticket anywhere. We don't have them. We booked online. We're collecting them at the box office. 4. I know, I know, my hair's a mess, but I'm getting it cut on Saturday. Not before time. Oh, you can talk. Look at yours. Five. I'm really sorry. I know I was going to give you a hand with your move, but... Yeah, and boy, do I need help. I know you do, but I've just learnt I'm working in the Paris office next week and I can't get out of it. Oh, never mind. It was good of you to offer. But I'll help you with the decorating when I'm back. Thanks. That'd be great. Six. Can you believe it? This time next week, we'll be sipping cocktails by a swimming pool. Yeah. Before going out for an amazing meal in an amazing restaurant overlooking the sea. <laughs> and paying amazing prices. <laughs> Seven. I'm aiming high. By the time I'm 40, I'll have set up my own business and I'll be earning a fortune. Wow, you've really got your future sorted. Yeah, I simply won't consider failure. I admire your confidence. I haven't a clue what I'll be doing when I'm 40. Eight. I'm so sorry. I was going to get in touch and say let's meet for coffee, but I've had flu. Not to worry. I'll meet you next week. Just say where and when. Well, I was going to suggest the Café Nero, near your work. Fine. Is Tuesday OK for you? Tape script 11.7 1 One of my cats is quite tame and domesticated. Ouch! The other is totally wild. You can say that again. 2 I've always been successful at work, but my private life is a total failure. Oh, you're being very hard on yourself. Tape script 11.8 Margie's Diary Gee, what a waste. When you're through with the book, you just throw it away, I guess. Our television screen must have had a million books on it, and it's good for plenty more. I wouldn't throw it away. Where did you find the book? In my house, in the attic. What's it about? School. School? What's there to write about school? I hate school. Why would anyone write about school? Because it's not our kind of school, stupid. This is the old kind of school that they had hundreds and hundreds of years ago, centuries ago. Well, I don't know what kind of school they had all that time ago. They had a teacher? Sure, they had a teacher, but it wasn't a regular teacher. It was a man. A man? How could a man be a teacher? Well, he just told the boys and girls things and gave them homework and asked them questions. But a man isn't smart enough. Sure he is. My father knows as much as my teacher. He can't. A man can't know as much as a teacher. My dad knows almost as much, I betcha. Well, I wouldn't want a strange man in my house to teach me. <laughs> you don't know much, Margie. The teachers didn't live in the house. They had a special building, and all the kids went there. And all the kids learned the same thing? Sure, if they were the same age. 
But my mother says a teacher has to be adjusted to fit the mind of each boy and girl it teaches, and that each kid has to be taught differently. Just the same, they didn't do it that way then. If you don't like it, you don't have to read the book. I didn't say I didn't like it. Margie, school. Not yet, Mama. Now. And it's probably time for Tommy, too. Tommy, can I read the book some more with you after school? Maybe. Today's arithmetic lesson is on the addition of proper fractions. Please insert yesterday's homework in the proper slot. Oh. When we add the fractions, one half. <sighs> oh, how the kids must have loved it in the old days with a real teacher and other kids. What fun they had. Unit 12. Turning Points. Tape Script 12.1. The Fall of the Twin Towers. And the day started um, much like any other day. I got on the subway. We came across the bridge and I remember noticing what a lovely day it was uh, with the bright blue sky. I remember coming out of the subway as I normally did and I saw a, um, saw a cloud or what looked like a, a small cloud white cloud and I remember thinking gosh that's unusual because this sky is so totally clear but I didn't think much more of it and I set off walking to my office um, I didn't get far I got to the, uh, the the first block and on the corner there were a couple of people um, looking up staring up at the tower um, so I looked down at what they were looking at and um, noticed that there what seemed to be to me at the time anyway a small hole and you could actually see a few bits of flame around the edge. And I asked these two people what happened. And um, one of them said that a plane had flown into it. And I remember thinking, oh, gosh, no, that can't be true. But as I walked, there was more and more smoke coming out. Well, I made it to my office and um, uh, went up to the 16th floor. So I went into the office and there were lots of my colleagues there. Obviously, there was a lot of sort of confusion and... So I went to one of these offices with the clearest view and looked out and I remember thinking, gosh, I don't remember that. There's a, there's a hole in the other side. Quite a few people who were in the office earlier than me that morning, they'd, um, they'd, they'd seen both of them. They started telling me about this second one that went down the river um, and sort of exploded towards them um, because it came from the south. Um, soon you could start to see they were obviously started to evacuate and there were um, just thousands of people walking straight up towards us and just pouring pouring up towards us um, I tried to phone family and friends but uh, none of the phones seemed to work um, so I sent out a, an email that seemed to be the one thing that was still working I couldn't speak to any of my family in England I did speak to my wife once when I first got in and told her to wake up and turn on the television and see what was happening. I was unable to get through to her after that. The sort of surreal goings on, sending these emails backwards and forwards about uh, about what was happening um, outside uh, my very window. And it was while I was writing an email, I heard some screams and I, I ran round um, just to see sort of this huge, huge cloud of smoke and people just shouting and screaming, it collapsed, it collapsed. This huge cloud of dust came, you could see it pouring up the avenues and it sort of burst out um, through Battery Park, right out into the Hudson River um, because I remember seeing lots of the ferries were all doing evacuations, taking people from every point they could and they just got enveloped in this huge cloud of dust. There was so much dust, you didn't know, you know, whether, how much it had fallen, whether it was just the top. I suppose we're all expecting to see something still there. We'd still see the other one standing because it had the uh, the big antenna, the big aerial on top of it. 
so as I stood there watching, I had no idea how long for, and then, of course, the other one collapsed. You could clearly see there was a very particular design, these long, long, um, sort of slightly ornate metalwork. I remember seeing that sort of explode out, and then you just saw the great big top with this giant aerial on just drop straight down, and you'd see all this other stuff just peeling away from the sides. Um, you could see just each corner of it peeling back and this giant top just smashing down through it. And obviously there was all the dust and everything and um, more screaming. We all thought, because we'd seen so many, so many thousands of people walking north, that, that maybe everyone had got out um, because there was this you know, non-stop procession of people. In fact, I think our, our brains didn't even think about the fact that there were people inside it. You just sort of looked at it as a building and you just assumed that there was, there was no one in it. You just don't actually want to think about that. It was, you know, unlike any feeling you've ever thought. There wasn't really, there was no panic in the office. And also, um, you know, very clear acknowledgement that um, something, had, uh, something had changed in the world today and we were sitting staring at it. It was quite the most incredible thing. And from what was just a normal, lovely New York autumn day, it's just incredible how much changed in that morning. Tape script 12.2. When man first saw the earth. 10, nine, we have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit. We have, we have liftoff. Liftoff the inspirational effect of Apollo, which touched so many of us watching from Earth, was largely driven by the pictures which these missions returned. Views of human explorers on an alien world fueled our imaginations. And those images of our home planet, filmed by men who were so far away from home, had an even more profound effect. In December 1968, Apollo 8, only the second manned Apollo mission, was sent straight to the moon. It was the first time any astronauts had left low Earth orbit, and if everything went to plan, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell and Bill Anders would become the first humans to see the far side of the moon with their own eyes. Actually, I think the best way to describe this area is the vastness of black and white. Absolutely no colour. The sky up here is also a rather forbidding, uh, promoting of blackness with no stars visible when we're flying over the Earth, over the moon in daylight. But it wasn't their unique views of the moon which these missions became most famous for. It was their views of the Earth, rising over the barren lunar surface, which fired the imaginations of us all. Historian Robert Poole is the author of Earthrise, How Man First Saw the Earth. The NASA um, head of photography, Dick Underwood, was keen on getting photographs of the Earth. He had a lot of experience, but he was pretty much a lone voice in NASA. So although he'd done his best to prepare them for taking photographs, they weren't prepared in any professional kind of way. So when they did actually see the Earth rise from, from lunar orbit, it did take them completely by surprise, and you can hear the surprise in their voices. Wow, look at that. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, that's pretty. Yes, it's about the, the fourth orbit or something, isn't it? And there's a real scramble for the camera and some colour film, I think. You got a colour film, Jim? Hand me a roll of colour. Oh, man, that's great. Where is it? Quick. Yes, they didn't have a camera ready. They only had black and white film in the one that they were using. The spaceship had only just turned around to face the right way. They were busy doing something else. And suddenly one of them said, look, there's the Earth. What, in retrospect, was the most significant moment, possibly the entire Apollo program, looking back and seeing the Earth in context. The fact that no one planned those pictures seems extraordinary now. But the astronauts' encounter with the Earth would inspire future Apollo crews to look back with new eyes on their home planet. 
Yes, everything's looking good here, uh, Apollo 9. Okay. We'll try to have you cut off time shortly. Apollo 9 was intended to test the entire Apollo flight system in Earth orbit, and astronaut Rusty Schweikart would make a spacewalk to test an emergency procedure for transferring between the Apollo capsule and the lunar module in case the two failed to connect. Hey, Mr. Parker, proceed out the door. Is there a camera on there, CMP? It's running. Okay. Proceeding on out. On board, his colleagues Jim McDivitt and Dave Scott would capture his progress on camera. But as his test began, their camera broke. And whilst they were fixing it, Rusty ended up with five minutes outside on his own. Oh dear, that looks comfortable. Oh boy, what have you? Good for Really good. During that five minutes that Dave took to try and repair the camera, which frankly never happened, I held onto the handrail only with one hand, my left hand, and I sort of swung around to get a full f view of the earth and the horizon, uh, just the spectacular beauty of, of the earth. I mean, uh, the, the blackness is so black, and the horizon is this brilliant, thin band of blue, which is the atmosphere above the blue and white earth. I mean, the, the contrast, the reality of what you're looking at, I mean, it is incredibly impressive. This would have been a wholly personal experience if Rusty hadn't been invited to speak at a major conference organized by the Lindisfarne Association in Long Island, New York, a couple of years later. Despite preparing for several hours, he had no idea what he was going to say until he found himself on stage. And then I opened my mouth and I talked, and it was as, as if I was sitting in the audience going through the experience of flying in space at many different levels, actually. The physical level, uh, sort of a technical uh, the diary almost, and then finally at a, at a kind of spiritual level. And I had absolutely no plan to do that. I mean, it, that, it just came out that way, and uh, by the time I was done, uh, half of the people in the audience were crying, including me. Okay, pull in. You look down there and you can't imagine how many borders and boundaries you cross again and again and again, and you don't even see them. There you are, hundreds of people in the Middle East killing each other over some imaginary line that you're not even aware of, that you can't see. And from where you see it, the thing is a whole, and it's so beautiful. You wish you could take one in each hand, one from each side in the various conflicts and say, look, look at it from this perspective. Look at that. What's important? That spontaneous lecture, later titled No Frames, No Boundaries, and transcribed as an essay about the Earth and us, resonated with the burgeoning peace and environmental movements of the time. And the images of Earth that poured back from the eight subsequent Apollo flights to the moon continued to raise our awareness of just how fragile our home planet seems to be. Tape script 12.3 Conversation 2 Hi Annie. Fancy bumping into you here. I haven't seen you for ages. I know. Time flies, doesn't it? It sure does. Is your business still booming? Yeah, I'm slaving away as usual. We're snowed under with orders at the moment, and I'm only just keeping my head above water. Still, mustn't grumble. How's your company doing? OK. Things went downhill a bit last year, and we had to tighten our belts, but they're picking up now. And how's life in your sleepy little village? Very nice. It's such a good place to unwind. Mm. Uh, look, I must dash now, but I'll be in touch soon and get you round for dinner. That will be great. Hope to see you soon. Tape script 12.4 Light 1. It was the film Twelve Angry Men that sparked my interest in law. Two. The team's victory was overshadowed by the serious injury of their star striker. 3. I've had a bright idea. It just came to me in a flash. 4. I don't trust that guy you met last night. 
He seems a shady character. Five. The space station is a shining example of international cooperation. Six. I'd wondered why Bill's so rude, and then it dawned on me that he was jealous. Weather. Seven. There's another article on internet privacy here. It's a hot topic at the moment. Eight. I was relieved to get the hospital test results. It's been a cloud hanging over me. Nine. Don't ask me how to pronounce that word. I haven't the foggiest idea. Ten. You needn't worry about passing your driving test. It'll be a breeze for you. Eleven. It was a whirlwind romance, and Steve and Linda were married within six weeks. Twelve. I knew this would be my new home, and a feeling of happiness flooded through me. Food. Thirteen. My job interview lasted over an hour. They gave me a really good grilling. Fourteen. I'm struggling in this job. I think I've bitten off more than I can chew. Fifteen. Oh, another of your half-baked ideas. You need to think things through more. Sixteen. Jones's athletics career ended on a sour note when he failed a drugs test. Seventeen. It's a rather bland autobiography. You don't learn anything very exciting. Eighteen. Hmm. Thanks for your suggestions. That's given me food for thought. Tape script twelve point five. The tipping point. Malcolm Gladwell wrote the tipping point in order to explain the way social trends suddenly take off, using Hush Puppy's shoes as his first example. Until their comeback in the late nineties, Hush Puppies had been a dying brand, owing to the fact that they were seen as old-fashioned. After a few young hipsters began wearing them in the clubs of Manhattan in nineteen ninety-five, though, the fashion began to spread. When fashion designers started wearing them too, sales boomed, and in the end, the shoes became one of the most popular fashion icons of the decade. This rapid turnaround in fortunes occurred even though the Hush Puppies company itself had played almost no part in it. Gladwell compares such social trends to medical epidemics, although they may begin with only a few people being infected. Provided that these individuals are influential and well connected, the trend will slowly grow until the tipping point is reached, at which point the rate of spread accelerates enormously. The tipping point made interesting reading for marketing executives, as it showed that while widespread publicity may be achieved by expensive advertising campaigns. Similar levels of exposure can be gained for far less as a result of word-of-mouth marketing. What's more, the advent of social media has greatly increased the role of viral marketing in starting social trends. Tape script twelve point six. One. As well as studying English, I'm doing an evening class in photography. Two. Once this course is over, I'm going to have a holiday in the UK. Three. I know you're a good driver. All the same, I think you should drive more slowly on this road. Four. I'm nervous about the exam, even though I've done loads of revision for it. Five. Seeing as there are lots of sales on, I'm going to spend the afternoon shopping. Six. You can leave work early, provided that you've finished all those jobs I gave you. Seven. 
I arrived on time in spite of all the traffic. 8. By the time you wake up tomorrow, I'll be in New York. Tape script 12.7 1. I didn't need quite so much detail about your operation. Well, you did ask. 2. Didn't you think it strange that the car was so cheap? Well, I did wonder. 3. It's so embarrassing when Ken tells those sexist jokes. Yes, I do wish he wouldn't. 4. You didn't have to challenge Ken in front of everyone. Maybe. He did deserve it, though. 5. You shouldn't treat Emma like a child. Well, she does behave like one sometimes. 6. I can't believe how violent that DVD you lent me was. I did warn you. Tape script 12.8. A potato clock. I was teaching an intermediate class and there was a Japanese girl in it, Keiko, who was sharing a flat with an English girl. One day, Keiko came up to me after class and said, Excuse me, what is a potato clock? I was a bit baffled and said, Sorry, a what? She repeated, A potato clock. My flatmate told me she has to get one tomorrow, but I didn't understand. I just had to admit to her that I had no idea what a potato clock was and that she'd better ask her flatmate to explain. It was only later that it dawned on me what her flatmate had said. Tape script 12.9 I have to get a potato clock tomorrow. Tape script 12.10 this is an evening of anticipation and excitement. Tape script 12.11 1. It's an honour to present this award for best invention. 2. The name is in an envelope as usual. 3. I'll open it and read it out straight away. Tape script 12.12 A Blue eyes B Two oranges C Go away D My office E The economy F Three apples. Tape script 12.13. Law and order. Carla and Mike. Tape script 12.14. One. Anna and I are off to eat out in Oxford. Two. Although it's the obvious answer, it isn't the easiest option. 3. My aim is to sit on this sofa all evening and watch action and adventure movies. Tape script 12.15 J-O-H-N-S-P-E-A-R-S Tape script 12.16 1. It isn't easy to wreck a nice beach. 2. This guy is the limit. 3. Some others will leave and say goodbye. 4. Six students had a great A. 5. I scream in an ice cold shower. Tape script 12.17. 1. 
I have no notions of danger. 2. It's important to give children a name. 3. I told the postman I only accept addressed mail. 4. We discussed the subject of euthanasia. 5. Don't tell me that's tough. Tape script 12.18 Alexander Fleming was born in 1881 in Ayrshire, Scotland, where his father, who died when Alexander was seven, worked as a farmer. After leaving school, Fleming worked as a shipping clerk in London for four years. However, he inherited some money when he was 20 and enrolled at St Mary's Hospital School in order to pursue his interest in medicine. On completing his medical degree in 1908, winning gold medal as the top medical student, he joined the research team at St Mary's. During the First World War, Fleming served in the Medical Corps in France, working in a hospital set up in a casino in Boulogne. There he saw many soldiers die from wound infections and consequently decided to specialise in this area of medicine. Once the war was over, Fleming returned to St Mary's and thereafter applied himself to research into bacteria. On September the 28th, 1928, having just returned from a holiday, Fleming was cleaning Petri dishes in his laboratory so that he could reuse them. Owing to his general untidiness, the dishes had been left out in the warm laboratory for a month and were therefore covered in bacteria as well as mould. As Fleming picked up one dish, he noticed that no bacteria were growing around the mould, so he decided to study it, in case it proved to be an antibacterial agent. Although Fleming discovered the world's first antibiotic, penicillin, it was two other researchers, Flory and Chain, who found a way to bring it to mass production in 1942, thus changing the face of modern medicine. By the time of the D-Day landings in 1944, enough penicillin had been produced to treat all of the wounded Allied forces in World War II.